The meeting, committee is meeting today to continue its study on foreign election interference. Before we begin, and this is the point I would like all members to hear very clearly, that all comments should be addressed through the chair. There should be one person speaking at a time. This is a meeting that we've been looking forward to, and I know it's really important to all of us, and therefore I will ask that we ask a question or make a comment and we provide time for an answer. And I will also let you know that the health of interpreters and the people who do their important work on Parliament Hill is paramount for me. Because it's the way we advance a country with two official languages and that's something I think most of us wholeheartedly believe in. So that is my signal to you once again that I would expect only one person is speaking at a time and that we maintain a little bit of eye contact to know that we want the floor to pass, however we do, we're capable of doing this. The clerk and I will maintain a consolidated speaking list of members wishing to speak. And today we have with us um, Ms. Katie Telford, Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister. And as a person who observes the Sikh faith, a member of the Sikh community, I do want to wish everyone celebrating a happy Vasaki. This is a really big deal in our community, so I just want to express that to everyone who is here in person and watching. So thank you. Uh, Ms. Telford, you will now have um, time for an opening statement and then we will proceed to questions and comments from committee members. Ms. Telford, welcome to Prague. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thought I'd start by explaining my role and how I receive intelligence. Um, my job is to advise the Prime Minister and manage the Prime Minister's office. A key part of my role is ensuring he receives advice um, and information from all parts of government so that he can make the best decisions possible. This includes briefings from the National Security and Intelligence Advisor, the NSIA, and other intelligence officials. I am usually with the Prime Minister for these briefings. Sometimes we receive these briefings in secure settings known as SCIFs. That stands for Sensitive Compartmented Information Facility. All of our phones and electronics get locked up by the elevator and don't enter the floor, let alone the room itself. Other times, the NSIA will request that I read a document that is brought to me by a crow, a client relations officer. The crow hands me the document, supervises me while I read it, and takes it back. S sensitive intelligence is treated with the utmost care. There is a rigorous vetting process to obtain top secret clearance, which I have, and there are equally important obligations one must uphold to keep that clearance. That is because publicly disclosing what our intelligence agencies know or how they come to know it can irreparably harm Canada's national interests and put people's lives in danger. It can also threaten Canada's ability to obtain intelligence in the future because Canada is a net importer of intelligence. In my years in this job, I have seen a huge range of intelligence from all parts of the world. Some of it has been wrong, proven wrong, some of it right, some we may never know, or only with time will we learn if it's true. Even intelligence that is proven wrong can be useful. It can shed light on the motivations or the agenda of the source or a narrative that is being pushed. Intelligence often comes as fragments of information that then needs to be analyzed, assessed, discussed, to understand what they really mean. And that work has to be done by situating those fragments in a wider context of information. As the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs told you at this very committee, intelligence rarely paints a full, concrete, or actionable picture. Depuis 2015, since 2015, our government has strengthened the measures that protect our institutions against foreign interference. I can confirm with certainty that, that it has always been a priority and that we have undertaken concrete actions on this file. It is therefore important to take a moment to look at the work that we have accomplished. In its 2015 platform, the Liberal Party had promised to create what is today the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. He, as a, an MP under the Afghan detainee issue under the Harper government, Prime Minister Trudeau noted the need for some MPs to have access to classified intelligence, which was not the case previously. 
That is why our government passed a bill to create this committee. For six years now, MPs of all stripes have received, with a, a top secret security clearance, examine classified intelligence, study it independently, and report on it publicly. And the committee is now working on a review to assess the state of foreign interference in federal electoral processes, among others. The threat of foreign interference has evolved since 2015. We saw what happened during the American elections in 2016 and the French elections in 2017. So to better protect our federal elections in 2019, the government established a public protocol for major electoral incidents. And this protocol was part of our cross-government plan to protect Canadian democracy, which was launched in January 2019. The protocol, which is administered by senior public servants with access to classified information on national security, determined that the elections of 2019 and 2020 were held freely and fairly. In 2019, we also establish an office to monitor national security and intelligence activities. And the office will examine our security and intelligence agencies to assess foreign interference before and after the last two elections. We also created the mechanism for rapid response and the working group on on security and intelligence threats targeting elections. All of those who help, both of those help us manage uh, foreign threats affecting our democracy and to counter them. As the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs told you, the tools to fight against foreign interference are more and more numerous. By May 23rd, former Governor General David Johnson will, will provide us with his recommendations on the matter. He will have unlimited access to classified documents to do his work. And of course, we already know that we, we will accept these recommendations. The Minister's office was told about specific intelligence and what we did as a result. I will do my best to answer your questions. At the same time, I must respect the law and the same boundaries as the Director of CSIS and the NSIA did when they appeared before you. These constraints are exactly why NSICOP was created. But what I can say here is this. When we receive intelligence briefings of any kind, we don't leave any stones unturned. We usually start by asking a lot of questions. Questions like, how credible is the intelligence? Who else has been briefed? Who else needs to be briefed? What decisions are in front of decision makers? What actions have already been taken? What actions can be taken? and what authorities are needed to take them. Very often, they are not within the Prime Minister's or Cabinet's authorities. By that, I mean those are decisions for law enforcement or intelligence officials. And as you've heard from them about the tools they have available, like CSIS's threat reductions. All that being said, if there are actions to be taken to protect national security, we do not hesitate. Let's remember that foreign interference threatens all democracies, it comes from many authoritarian states, like China, Russia, and Iran. It targets all aspects of society, our communities, particularly diaspora communities, our universities, research institutes, all levels of government, and all political parties. It is not a new threat, but it is an evolving threat. It is a threat we will continue to do our utmost to guard against. I want to end by addressing the debate around my appearance today, and whether I am the right person to appear before you. I am a consumer of intelligence, not the one who briefs on intelligence. The NSIA is the person who directly reports to the Prime Minister on these matters. On top of that, for all the reasons outlined today, these matters are extremely sensitive, and the law limits what I can talk about in this public setting. Ultimately, I have accepted this invitation because I want Parliament to work. I've devoted my, most of my professional life to getting people involved in politics, to run for office, to advance the causes that they believe in, and to make a difference in their community and in their country. That's why I'm here, and I believe why we're all here. Protecting our democracy is one of the most important things we can do and one of the most important parts of my job. Campaigns, politics, and democracy are all about people expressing their rights and electing who represents them, I will always fight for these rights and defend against any attempts to undermine them. 
And with that, I will do my very best to answer your questions. Thank you, Ms. Telford, uh, for those opening com uh, comments and for being here with us today. We will now commence with six minute rounds, starting with Mr. Brock, followed by Ms. Sahoda, et puis Madame Goudreau. And then Madame Go Goudreau, followed by Madame Blaney. Please, one person will speak at a time. And Mr. Brock, the floor is yours. And I'll just give a quick reminder that this is procedure in House Affairs Committee. It is not a courtroom. So if we can provide some time to ask a question, make a comment, and some answer, that allows our interpreters to work best. Interpreters, can you see me? Vous pouvez m'entendre? S'il y a un problème, s'il vous plaît, levez la main. Et je vais arrêter la rencontre pour que vous pouvez faire le travail qui est très... Please raise your hand if needed so that we can continue your important work. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon, Ms. Telford. Thank you for your attendance today. Ms. Telford, uh, did the Prime Minister receive a series of briefings from Canada's National Spy Agency beginning in January 2022 on Beijing's election interference, uh, specifically in the 2019 election? I believe you uh, received from the National Security and Intelligence Advisor and from the Privy Council Office a listing of briefings that the Prime Minister has received on the subject. Yes, so you're referring to the document that um, was undertaken by the National Security Officer, uh, Jody Thomas, on March the 1st uh, of this year that we received this morning at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I've looked at this, and there is no indication about any briefings in January of 2022. But noteworthy, the uh, commentary on the uh, beginning of page number one indicates the list is not exhaustive, as the records are not complete in all cases. And this only represents formal briefings as opposed to informal briefings. So I'll ask the question again. Did the Prime Minister receive a series of briefings beginning in January 2022 on Beijing's election interference in the 2019 election? Yes or no? I think, Madam Chair, the answer may have been given in the question, which is that in the preamble and the memo, it talks about how there's all kinds of conversations that go on this go on about some of these topics um, that can't all be captured in terms of formal briefings and you have the list of formal briefings that are provided in so the So I can take that as a yes, that he would have received some informal briefings in and around that time frame, January of 2022, as reported by Global News on November the 7th of 2022. I can't speak specifically to what was discussed in briefings over the course of those months and whether I, it was related to what was in the report. Again, Ms. Telford, I'm not asking for specifics. I'm asking you to confirm that it's more than likely, in fact, it did happen that he would have received briefings along those lines in January of 2022, notwithstanding that it's not repeated in this particular document that we got today did and more than likely in my experience are different things. I think it is quite possible that there were discussions throughout that time period around foreign interference as, um, as I think the Prime Minister said yesterday. We have talked about these subjects a lot over many years uh, because there's been a lot of activity and a lot of work that this government has done on this front. And the Prime Minister was, uh, was briefed on China's Toronto consulate directing a large clandestine transfer of funds to at least 11 federal election candidates and numerous Beijing operatives who worked as their campaign staffers. That was the subject matter of those series of briefings in January of 2022. Are you confirming that? No, Madam Speaker, I can't, un unfortunately, I can't provide information about what I have or have not been briefed on um, in an intelligence setting um, or in a public setting about intelligence. But what I can remind uh, the members through you, Madam Chair, of is what the NSIA said when she was here, actually on March 1st at this very committee, and she said the connection that was being made between 11 candidates uh, and funds that you're describing, that that was inaccurate. If this was completely inaccurate, if this story of global news on November the 7th was completely inaccurate, you would have said so, your prime minister would have said so, your members of cabinet would have said so. So I'm asking you specifically, apart from 
the issue of clandestine transfers to 11 candidates. The other subject matter of those briefings, is that false? Is that inaccurate in any way? I'm sorry, you might have to clarify the question, Madam Chair. You, you've highlighted that there was an issue with respect to the Prime Minister never receiving any information respect, respect to the transfer of monies to specific candidates. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the broader description of evidence and intelligence that was shared with the Prime Minister in a series of briefings in January 2022, as reported by Global News. Is that inaccurate? So, Madam Speaker, I can't speak to the reporting that Global News um, spoke of, but I can speak to my experience, which is that there have been a lot of conversations over many years. Um, it's why all the different mechanisms that I outlined were put in place leading into the, 20, the, the 2019 election and the 2021 election. There were further steps taken in between those two elections. Thank you. Did the Privy Council Office prepare a document entitled Special Report Date Stamped January 2022? Yes or no? I can't speak to that. Why? Because I'm not sure what document you're referencing. If you can give me some more information, I probably still won't be able to confirm whether or not it's something I saw, but I'd be it happy was to try. Reported, it was reported in uh, the Global News of March the 8th. It was reviewed by Sam Cooper, the reporter. It was date stamped and finalized, suggesting it was intended to be read by the Prime Minister and senior aides, including yourself. It was derived from 100 CSIS reports from investigations beginning in January 2019 and produced by the Intelligence Assessment Secretariat, a division of the PCO. It was a part of a series of briefings beginning in January 2022, again confirming the large clandestine transfer of funds earmarked for the federal election from the consulate in Toronto, which transferred that funds to an elected provincial government official via a staff member of a 2019 federal candidate. You are responsible ultimately for the PCO. The PCO is the arm of the Prime Minister. It's his own department. They report to you. You control the PMO. Are you suggesting that this special report as prepared by the Intelligence Assessment Secretariat did not occur? Okay, Ms. Telford, sorry, before I continue, um, I think as members of Parliament, we've all served in the House. And when you suggest you, you are referring to the chair in this role. Yes, Mr. I Proc, am. I did. You are referring to me. No, I'm not referring to you. I through not, you, Madam Chair. I was hoping so. I through did not you. hear those important through you two yes, words. Yes, thank you. Uh, but I did appreciate, for the most part, um, the exchange. And I think it was nice that we were able to let pauses so the interpreters can do their work. But if we were going to be at a spot that we are... Um, perhaps putting words in other people's mouths, then I need us to go through the chair. Right. Madam Chair, will you allow the witness to answer the question? It will be coming out of possible later time, but yes, I would love to do that. Ms. Telford. So I should answer now? Okay. Um, I, um, I just want to clarify, because you, uh, sorry, through the, through the chair, uh, the member was asserting a number of things about what I do, and I want to go back to what I said in, the, in my opening statement about my role. Uh, the Privy Council Office does not report to me. I manage the Prime Minister's Office. I do, however, work very closely with the Privy Council Office, and there's some extraordinary public servants in there, including one who reports directly to the Prime Minister, the National Security and Intelligence Advisor. And I want to remind uh, the room again, Madam Chair, of what she said, which was that the connection that was being made between the 11 candidates and essentially much of what you're saying there was inaccurate. Thank you, and I appreciate you uh, keeping that brief because I do try to make sure that the time of the question and answer are the same. Um, and I will now proceed to Mrs. Sahoda. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, first of all, thank you, Ms. Telford, for coming here today. I, um, I still hold the belief that staff uh, should not be the ones that are held accountable, but I want to thank you for taking the time out to come today to make Parliament functional. Um, it's important to see that you've done that at many times uh, during your time here as Chief of Staff, and not many others have ever done that. So um, I think that goes to show that you are a leader. However, I think some of the things that have been 
um, implied, which you've clarified, the fact that um, a chief of staff controls PCO is, is untrue. Um, and you've, in your, in your opening remarks, made it quite clear that uh, many times as a consumer of intelligence, uh, you do your due diligence in terms of finding out what has been done, what can be done, and whether you even within the office of the Prime Minister, anyone has authority to do so. And so I think that is really important. And maybe we can get to some of what Mr. Brock is pr uh, trying to get at. And I think perhaps what we need is a better understanding of how you get briefed on intelligence and specifically what type of intelligence is brought to your attention, by whom uh, is that intelligence brought, and um, what happens exactly in specific circumstances when you receive that. Um, so thank you, Madam Chair. It, it, intelligence comes to us in many different forms from many different parts of the government, though it all ultimately funnels through the Privy Council Office and uh, the NSIA in terms of what comes directly to us. Um, and so they kind of bring together so many different parts of government um, where intelligence can get collected from uh, the Global Affairs Department to D&D and CSE. There's a glorious number of acronyms uh, that uh, can uh, sometimes and, and not always roll off the tongue easily, but um, they produce all that information and then it comes into the PCO intelligence analysis unit that will pull it together and determine what needs to make its way to the Prime Minister. And the NSIA, as I mentioned earlier, will flag some information that she will want read. Sometimes I will walk into the office and the crow will be sitting there and I know I need to clear my schedule to read something. Um, and other times it will get scheduled. Sometimes it's formal briefings. Sometimes, you know, we just, we see something, sometimes in reporting, and we will need to just catch up quickly in a sort of pull aside, as they say in government, um, in, uh, in, in uh, wherever we can find the time. And also, of course, ahead of any international meetings, um, whether they be international meetings happening here in Canada or happening when we're traveling around the world, uh, it's particularly important because we work very, very closely with our allies um, on, on all matters to do with intelligence as well, particularly our Five Eyes partners. And so there's a lot of different opportunities that we talk about these things, which is why it, it gets complicated to try to pin down some of these briefings in uh, the way I was being asked about. Um, I guess I'll, I'll move on to um, part of your role is making sure that the prime minister gets the best information. So through these briefings, um, I'm assuming that at times it seems like from, from your description, it's just you getting briefed uh, on some of the matters. Um, given that you're not an intelligence official yourself and a consumer, you rely on the work of these officials that's given to you. How do you then determine um, what um, is then briefed or how, when and why the prime minister gets briefed? How do you make those decisions? Um, so again, as I mentioned in my opening statement, um, I'm usually with the Prime Minister when he's briefed on these matters, and it's actually pretty rare for me to have formal briefings where it's it's me alone. Um, it, it, it doesn't never happen, but it's pretty rare. And um, it's it's usually a question of scheduling when that happens more than anything, because it's, it's really based on the NSIA's advice. Sometimes other staff um, who are who are in the office, other senior staff, will meet with officials, or they'll they'll read something in reporting, and they'll say this is something that we should make sure the PM sees sooner than later. Um, but ultimately, all you know, even those thoughts will go to the NSIA, who will make the ultimate recommendation on what needs to be scheduled, who should be there, in what format he should get briefed. Okay, um, so. Talking about particularly foreign election interference, uh, you uh, are often, I'm sure all of these briefings that you're discussing are not particularly about election interference, they're about uh, travel that you do and interactions, uh, foreign relations with many countries. Uh, I imagine this, uh, the scale and scope of the amount of intelligence that you receive on any given day uh, is quite vast given the uh, international issues going on around the world with Ukraine, um, with the Chinese spy balloons, and, and, and many things that we're seeing even in the news down south uh, in the last few days. So given that there, it is so vast, um, can you help us understand a little bit better as to uh, the amount of intelligence that uh, is provided to your office? 
Um, it, it varies, as you say, um, but it uh, dependent on, on events. Obviously, a lot more starts coming in um, around the time of, of the balloons, for example. Um, and certainly, um, in the lead up to, uh, as has been publicly spoken about before, um, and of course, following the invasion of Ukraine, um, there's been all kinds of intelligence that came in much more increasing volumes. And so, you know, it, it really does depend on the events, but there have been many events, as you said, in the last number of years. Mm -hmm. So this is a significant part of the job. And now we are continuing with Madame Godreau. Since we have two official languages, you may choose to speak in the language of your choice. Ms. Telford, I know you, sp under sp you speak French very well, but we don't have a lot of time. So I just wanted to let you know you may choose the language of your choice. Madame Godreau, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Ms. Telford. Since I have little time, Madam Chair, my questions will be very short. And we already have at, at the outset a few pieces of information. What we're seeking to know is what is the protocol, the internal protocol, which allows us to understand how information is transmitted. Can you give us a little bit more information about the protocol? It, it largely, as I said, and this is why, you know, there's a question around whether I'm the right person to be appearing here. And so, I, as I said, I'm going to do my best uh, because the, the and, and I apologize, I'm answering in English. I just want to make sure I'm getting it right and I can speak faster, um, is um, it's, it's largely run through the NSIA. I mean, that is who governs all the gathering of intelligence, and it's actually why the Prime Minister actually changed the title. It was the NSA when we came into government, and he actually inserted the word intelligence into it because that is such a huge part of the function of that function. And so they will gather, um, working with all the public servants that uh, that work for her, and working with other security agencies across government, all the information on whatever the given issues are in any given week. Um, there's weekly briefs, there's daily briefs, there's informal briefs, there's formal briefings. It really depends on what's going on in the world. Merci. Thank you very much. My question is even more specific, Madam Chair. Given that the advisor, the NSIA is there to guide you and inform you of what is urgent and important, my question is, what are the criteria? What are the signals that allow us to know that, as you say, Madam Chair, as Madam Telford said, that there's a red flag, that we need to be concerned. What are the criteria about uh, uh, for NSI, the NSIA's advice? Asked to her, I, I don't, I can't remember now, having read her her testimony here, whether she um, whether she answered a question like that. But it, it can, it's it's usually at least in terms of what makes its way to me. There may be things that don't make its way to me that, that should or to, or to the Prime Minister, but I can't speak to what I don't see. But what I do see, it's usually pretty self-evident uh, in terms of what is of, of importance. It's, it's, um, it's an interesting question, but it, it really is Justement, pretty self-evident. <laughs> well, Madam Chair, I'm just going to um, flesh that out by saying like, the criteria are to allow us to know who is responsible for knowing when it's a time where there need to be a validation of the processes established that maybe didn't work, of the urgency to take action, because to, ans to respond to the uh, visit by Madame Thomas, she said that the information was transmitted, but we want to know where is the information, how is it that maybe you how is it that maybe you weren't aware of, of foreign interference, as you say, and, and now people are saying, no, no, there was information. What are the criteria? We want to reassure people we are here in this process and we want to ensure things are watertight. So can you please reassure us, who is the information holder? How does this work within Cabinet with the Prime, with the prime Minister and Ministers? I guess I'll give it 
tr and I'll try to do it efficiently, two parts uh, to the answer. One is it is actually the National Security and Intelligence Officer, or advisor, um, who pulls all of that information together. But second, I think, you know, there are legitimate questions and um, we, we had them when we were in opposition um, as a party and they continue to exist today and even in government you have questions about whether everything's working right and it's actually why this government put in place NSCRA. And NS NSCRA is actually there to oversee the security agencies and to make sure all those parts are working and it's specifically working on this now. Madame la Présidente. Madam Chair, I would continue by saying if we're here today and know that this was the last day and we thank you for joining us. If we're here today, it's because we want to shed light and better understand this issue and it's a golden opportunity to know whether there is information that 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 might have been omitted. Can is there can you reassure voters that we have a system that is watertight? I am not convinced right now. So I have about 30 seconds left. Could you please tell us, because that's that's why we're here today. So what I would just say to, to reassure Canadians through you, um, Madam Chair, is I just know the incredible work that the senior officials do day in and day out on this. I spend a lot of time with them, and uh, they are constantly working to refine and improve processes, especially as new and different types of information comes forward. But uh, I, I know that any time there is action that can be taken, they take it, and I know that there's any time that the Prime Minister can take action, um, he takes it, and he certainly encourages that kind of action as well. I think I have right, a right to one more question. Madam Chair, could our witness tell us whether there is information that she is keeping within Cabinet and that is not shared either to ministers or the prime minister on foreign interference? No, there's not. There, if I'm understanding you correctly, there is nothing that is ever kept from the prime minister. Certainly not by me. Merci. Thank you. Madame Blaney. First. Well, thank you so much, Chair, and as always, everything that I say goes through the chair, and I want to thank our witness uh, for being here on this important issue. And I think the way I'll start is how I think I've started almost every question uh, during this study, is the fact that this is very serious. And the most important part for me is that Canadians are losing faith in our systems. And what I would hope around this table and all the people who are represented at this table is that our commitment is number one to Canadians and making sure that they have faith. And what has happened around foreign interference in our elections is that we've seen Canadians losing more and more faith. And that's where I am concerned. So uh, my questions uh, to Ms. Telford are simply this. We have seen the Liberal MPs in this committee repeatedly point out that the Mahara Arar public inquiry was really effective on shedding light on intelligence leaks and providing Canadians with transparency, even when the government at the time was providing misleading information regarding Mr. Arar. Given that even your former colleague, Gerald Butts, has called for a public inquiry, do you think one is needed? I think, as I mentioned in um, the opening statement, um, that for the very reasons you set out in terms of the importance of this issue, the seriousness of what we're talking about, um, they need also to take it out of the partisan arena and that it's an extremely complex issue for some of the reasons I laid out and for a number of other reasons I'm sure you've touched on in committee over time. Uh, that This is why the Prime Minister uh, walked through a number of actions he took and um, a number of different follow-ups that are ongoing as we speak. As I just mentioned in a previous answer, there's I'm NSCRA. So sorry to interrupt. I certainly don't want to hurt the interpreters because they are very important to us and provide the ability for us to do our work. So I'm, I'm just, it seems to me that you're not interested in really answering the question because what we're seeing is more and more distrust from the Canadian public. And I think a public inquiry would make a difference because then people would see it come out of the partisan sphere. And right now it's having to stay in the partisan sphere because action is not being taken. So I'm just wondering, um, have you ever advised through the chair, of course, the prime minister against launching a public inquiry? And if so, why? 
So let me try again um, on uh, answering your question. I was certainly trying to. Um, I think a lot of people look at the, the po what's become known as POIC, the, um, the public inquiry that went on last fall in response to the Emergencies Act, and saw it having worked as another example. You spoke about another inquiry and said, why not do this? And there have been many discussions on this front, as you know, at this committee and in many other forums, including in our office and with the Prime Minister on this. And where we were able to come down um, as, as quickly as we could in our advice to him and in terms of the steps he then took was that we actually needed someone, and actually this is the same thing, uh, interestingly, that the previous government did when they appointed uh, former Governor General David Johnson uh, to do a similar task, was to figure out what was needed. Where were the gaps between, as I was starting to mention to you, NSIRA and NSI COP? What were they not able to cover? What did the public still need beyond that to ensure that we are instilling the confidence in them that they deserve to have in our institutions? Because that's extraordinarily important to us. And ensuring that the right mandates are created, that the right kind of, um, whether it's an inquiry or something else, and as I said in my opening statement, the Prime Minister committed to follow through on whatever the recommendations are that come out of the special rapporteur on this. It's not clear what the question should be. It's not clear what body is best to look at it, given the sensitive nature of the information. POIC, yes, looked at some security information. This is almost entirely national security information. So figuring out how to do that is a task that he's actually going to be reporting back within a few weeks. And I hope we can wait for that so that we can then do take those responsible next steps. Thank you so much, Ms. Telford. And through the chair, as always, could you just clarify, were you informed last year about the Chinese government funding at least 11 Liberal and Conservative candidates in the 2019 federal election? So, I, uh, Madam Chair, I will repeat um, again what, was, uh, what I've said a couple of times uh, to members uh, from the opposition, which is what the NSIA said when they were previously here at committee. I don't have information beyond being able to say this, and I thought this was pretty definitive, that the connection that was being made between these candidates and the funds was inaccurate. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm sorry to be upsetting you on these questions, but the Prime Minister said, let me be clear. I do not have any information, nor have I been briefed on any federal candidates receiving any money from China. So it feels like we got a clear answer, and I'm not getting that clear answer from you. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand this. It doesn't seem to make sense. And, you know, I, I am not one to bring in uh, staff members lightly. I take the role of people who are in charge really seriously. However, every time we turn around, it feels like there's another article, there's another thing coming out, and this slippery slope of information coming in and out and not being clear is leading people to distrust. So I'm just... Can you be as clear as the Prime Minister seems to be? Because Canadians are not having faith in the Prime Minister or in these roles, and it worries me. So can you make sense of that? Madam Chair, it sounds like the member thinks that the Prime Minister was clear on this. I think the Prime Minister was clear on this. I agree with what the Prime Minister said, so I'm not really sure how to add to that, because it sounds like if I'm adding to that, I'm actually confusing matters. So <laughs> um, I agree with what you're saying, or what's being said. That's my time, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Blaney. We will now enter to the second round of questions and we will start with Mr. Cooper, followed by Ms. O'Connell, suivi par Madame Normandin. Followed by Madame Normandin and then Madame Blaney. Mr. Bertolt, I'm Madame Romanato. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Telford, for appearing. Uh, Ms. Telford, through you, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Brock provided the context of the special report date stamped January of 2022. So now that he has provided that context, can you confirm that the Prime Minister received that document and did he read it? Uh, so in terms of the specific document that you're referencing that was mentioned in reporting, uh, sorry, Madam Chair, that the um, and that the previous member was mentioning, I can't speak to whether or not we've been briefed on um, any specific documents or any specific subjects. But taking a step back from that and to the member's second part of his question, of course the Prime Minister reads any documents he does receive. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Telford, when was the Prime Minister first briefed about Beijing's election interference in the 2019 election? When? 
Um, so you've received from, Madam Speaker, the, co the committee has received uh, from the NSIA the list of formal briefings that was put together as, as best everybody could uh, in terms of formal briefings on subjects to do with election Ms. foreign Ms. interference. Ms. Telford, uh, respectfully, through you, Madam Chair, I'm not just asking about formal briefings. I'm asking when did the Prime Minister become aware of Beijing's election interference in the 2019 election? Just the date, please. It's been five months. It's been repeatedly asked. Uh, you're the top official in the Prime Minister's office. Canadians deserve to know when he first learned about it. Could you please answer? Madam, Madam Speaker, I would just take a, or Madam Chair, I would take a step back and just say this has been an ongoing conversation over many months and years as to what prospects were of potential foreign interference. It's why these different organizations were in place. It's why there was a report that came out of the 2019 campaign yeah. or election. Again, uh, Ms. Telford, I want to be clear that uh, Canadians deserve uh, a date, so maybe to uh, provide uh, some, you know, to, to uh, provide further clarity, uh, the Intelligence Assessment Secretariat of the PCO prepared a daily foreign intelligence brief dated February 21st, 2020. Uh, in which uh, it, 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 that document has been produced to this committee, a heavily redacted version of that document. It speaks of, quote, uh, subtle but effective interference networks in the context of Beijing and its interference in the 2019 election. Uh, it speaks of, quote, investigations into activities linked to the Canadian federal election in 2019 reveal an active foreign interference network. On what date did the Prime Minister receive this document? I could not tell you what date he did or didn't receive a document. D did it's the Prime Minister receive that document? I, I don't have that information in front of me in terms of that specific document you're you, holding. You don't have any information about that document. Now, it was a daily and foreign intelligence brief. For you, Madam Chair, it was, in the, it was a daily foreign intelligence brief. Uh, Ms. Thomas said that it would have been in the Prime Minister's daily reading material. Would she be wrong? It may have been. Um, I am not suggesting she's wrong. It's that I can't speak to where he was that day. Sometimes briefs, briefs come in a whole bunch of different formats um, because those, that, those kinds of pieces of information are not just floating around. Um, so I don't know whether he got a verbal brief that day, whether he got a re weekly wrap-up that week, or whether this was a daily one that he it, it, had on his desk. This, this document has been widely reported. It's one of the very few documents that have been produced to this committee, and it's highly relevant mm -hmm to the question of what the Prime Minister knew and when he knew about Beijing's election interference. And your inability or refusal to answer uh, whether the Prime Minister had, in fact, read this document, was briefed about it, uh, is troubling. It doesn't inspire confidence, and in, in, in fact, it invites suspicion. And uh, perhaps your unwillingness to confirm that uh, is because, as Global News has reported, uh, that document spoke of, quote, foreign interference networks in the greater Toronto area that implicate at least 11 candidates in the 2019 election, uh, that Beijing's Toronto consulate was involved, and that it involved the clandestine transfer of funds. So, in other words, the Prime Minister seemingly knew as early as February of 2020 about candidates. Why has he misled Canadians for the past five months? Um, so a couple of things, Madam uh, Chair, is one, everything the Prime Minister receives, um, he spends a lot of time with and he most definitely reads. Uh, so I can confirm that if they are documents that he received, he absolutely read them. Second, that he's briefed on matters of foreign interference and matters of election foreign interference as per the documents you have received um, on a regular and ongoing basis. And third, on the specifics of what, of what you were referencing there, I can't get into, unfortunately, in this public setting, um, what was or wasn't briefed on um, in, in, the, in the level of specificity you'd like. Thank you. Mrs. O'Connell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Telford, for being here. Um, 
I want to start off with kind of following up where the Conservatives just left off. I think the Conservatives would have Canadians believe that foreign interference just began in 2019 and that uh, this is a relatively new phenomenon and they would like to find some smoking gun date. Uh, in fact, in your answer, Ms. Telford, you talked about the fact that foreign interference is ongoing and that's why there are several briefings on the topic. In addition to that, members of the House would have actually received the 2019 NSACOP annual report that talked about foreign interference, so they can look at their own dates of, in terms of when they were notified. But I want to get to the issues around foreign interference, the fact that it's not new. And you mentioned in your opening statement the fact that Canada is a net importer of intelligence. We can look at the situation that's happening in the U.S. right now. They're having very similar debates about foreign interference and um, national security information being in the public realm. And some of the comments being made in the U.S. right now are questioning if national security information is not held with the care and sensitivity that it deserves, will our ally, or in the U.S. context, will allies not want to share information with countries who don't treat foreign interf or um, national security information securely. As Canada is a net importer of intelligence, the requests from conservatives to have unredacted documents, to share details of national security information, details of briefings, um, would that not pose a significant risk if Canada no longer took the strong and firm approach to handle national security with the utmost most care and sensitivity that it deserves, would that put us in risk of re not receiving intelligence from, for example, our Five Eyes allies? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And that is why I raised it in the opening statement, that that is something that we have to always be uh, guarding against and careful about. We have to treat this material uh, with care, um, both because it can put lives at risk, most importantly, because it's in Canada's national interest to, um, to keep this information uh, protected, uh, but also because of the impact it could have in terms of relationships with allies who we share intelligence with and who we receive intelligence from. And it's actually one of the reasons that the government put into place uh, NSICOP, um, because it was actually something we looked at our allies, many of whom already had organizations like that. And it was something that the government before the current government um, did not put in place and did not take any steps on this front, despite having been embroiled in the Afghan detainee issue, which I spoke to in my opening statement as well. Uh, they just continued to provide information to the, or continued to refuse to provide information to the House when the House was looking for it then. And it was having lived through that experience that the Prime Minister made the commitment in the 2015 platform that we needed a body like NSI COP. And then some time was spent actually working with allies and learning from allies on how to put that together properly and in a way that could even be improved on from their own experiences um, before, it was, uh, before it was launched, I think, midway through the first mandate. Thank you. And Madam Chair, through you, um, the leader of the Conservative Party, Mr. Polyev, has said he refuses to get briefed on national security matters because he doesn't want to then be restricted to speak. Uh, the former leader, Mr. O'Toole, removed members from NSACOP. Um, there were statements that the now leader of the Conservatives, but when he was the Minister of Democratic Institutions, didn't take action on strengthening our democracy because he felt it wasn't in his partisan issues, yet they, uh, Conservatives continually remove their members from learning the facts of the national security uh, situation going on in this country in a secure way. Yet, when you appear today, and, and reasonably so, say there are going to be limitations on some of the information you can share in an open setting, conservatives say, what are you hiding, et cetera. Mr. Cooper's used collusion in the past. Could you maybe speak to the fact, uh, the reasonableness, that if Mr. Polyev doesn't want to be brief so that he is no longer constrained to keep national security matters confidential, 
that can you perhaps speak to why you're the sensitivity around your testimony today? Um, just very briefly, uh, I, I do sign documents um, that are declarations of indoctrination when I, um, in order to become cleared, and I take those things very seriously. Uh, and I think, you know, as, as was mentioned, Madam Chair, even the leader of the official opposition takes them so seriously that that's why he did not want to be briefed or cleared. Um, and so I think it sounds like people understand why I can't speak to these things. Thank you. Madame Normandie. Madame Normandie. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Telford, I'd like to come back to a response that you, you gave to my colleague, Madame Gaudreau, through you, Madam Chair. You mentioned that when information is received, the criterion that is used to know whether it would be transferred to the PM is, is obvious. You see it in the information whether it should be sent or not. Would that follow under what is evident, for example, uh, writings that receive money directly or indirectly from the Chinese consulate in Toronto? So I will just, I will go back again, um, either to, uh, as one of the other members of the opposition said, the Prime Minister's words or the NSIA words to this, uh, in the NSIA's case, it was to this committee or the Prime Minister's uh, words in, uh, in the House or publicly. Um, that the connection being drawn between those candidates and those funds is something that um, hadn't been briefed on and, and wasn't accurate in terms of how the reporting was. And the reporting evolved over time as well, I would just note. But it would seem that it's information that would deserve being transferred to the PM, would it not? Thank you very much. You mentioned also earlier always being present or nearly present when the Prime Minister receives information. In this case, case, were you present when this information was transmitted, whether it was by document or by informal meeting, because you said it was not a formal, it, uh, from February 2020? Do you recall being present with the Prime Minister when the information was transmitted? So, Madam Chair, if, if we're talking about the information that I just talked about being inaccurate, um, then there wasn't such a meeting to be present at. Um, but as I said in my opening statement, I am usually there when he's being briefed. There are times I'm not. When he's traveling and I'm not on that trip and he's getting briefed directly, then I'm not getting briefed at the same time, and those would be some of the rare occasions where I would be getting briefed separately. Um, but uh, in terms of the specific that you're referencing, it, it doesn't... Um, there's nothing more I think I can say on that. Thank you. Don't... It but nevertheless, when you receive information and when you consider that it is inaccurate, the information is still received. Do you recall receiving the information and then deemed it incorrect afterwards? No, I think yeah, some of that. Uh, some of that is uh, um, we learn through reporting, um, as as I think both have said. And uh, and yes, then there then there were conversations to try to figure out what some of these things were. And you can, you can see that in some of the timeline here, too. Merci. Thank you. So I think that in French, like in Punjabi, people speak a bit quicker. So, they, so two, two and a half minutes isn't very much time. But I didn't want to interrupt. But if you could speak a bit more slowly, I, I think Madame Gaudreau and others just to let you know that I understand that there are sometimes more words that need to be used, so I will give you a bit more time. But the, for the interpreters, if you could speak a bit more slowly, I, I will, I will work, work with you if we could do so next time. Does that work? Okay, thank you very much. Madame Blaney. Thank you so much, Chair. So my question, again, returns to the lack of trust that we see in Canadians having for our institutions and that it's really been shaken by these allegations. So should the current rapporteur, David Johnston, recommend against moving forward with a public inquiry in May? Do, do you think, Ms. Telford, that Canadians will accept that? Do you see any scenario where not moving forward with a public inquiry will help? 
I think I don't want to presume on uh, on what the special rapporteur is going to recommend, um, and uh, the the government and the prime minister has committed to following through on on the recommendations and to uh, when they come forward, and it, it's only it's not very long from now. Um, so I uh, I think we need to make sure that we follow through on that as expeditiously as possible, so that we can all together across all parties um, build build trust and continue to build trust in what is a it is a troubling issue for everybody. Uh, we all should be working on this together. So, you know, I think you mentioned uh, earlier in your testimony through the chair, of course, uh, a past example where there was a rapporteur uh, that was set up in place before an inquiry. I just want to be clear that in that case, um, the terms of the inquiry was the focus of the rapporteur to actually look at what those terms would be and how they would be followed. So right now, the process that, that's happening in Canada is sort of we're giving a broad brush to a rapporteur to just sort of tell us what to do next. It seems like that's the take of the government. Instead of saying what is going to be transparent and clear for Canadians, we know that there's been a lot of things said. It's become very partisan. There's a lot of distrust in our institutions, what's which concerns me greatly. So I'm just wondering, you know, I understand that you were trying to say that there's been rapporteurs before inquiries, but I think it's clear that we also know that those rapporteurs were set up to create the spectrum of what the inquiry would look like. This is very different. So I'm going to go back to the original question, which is, do you think Canadians will stand for it? And in the sense of the role that you play with the prime minister, is there any concern there that the voice of Canadians is not being heard and what they need isn't being delivered? Um, so Madam Chair, I just, first off, I mean, I agree with the concern and I think we should be all working to figure out um, paths forward uh, that can be constructive and ones that can be communicating as clearly to Canadians as possible, uh, that their institutions are strong and that they can have faith in their electoral systems. And that, yes, there is this, this threat that we have been talking about for years, but that obviously has received some more attention of late. And being able to explain clearly and concisely what that is and how the systems work to combat it, I think is extremely important. I'm not sure my understanding of the history of the previous rapporteur is the same as, as yours, um, but maybe we can, we'll can we figure that out later. Um, and uh, I think, but answering your final point, I think it's extremely important that we all figure out the answer to that. Um, so. I actually don't know that we're disagreeing that much other than uh, I don't want to presume where the special rapporteur goes, uh, whether it's to set an inquiry or come up with some other way of assuring Canadians that all the bases are being covered here. Thank you. Mr. Berthold, thank you. Mr. Berthold, you have five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Telford. Ms. Telford, I read an article from uh, February 17th, which talked about a strategy, a Chinese strategy to influence the 2021 Canadian election. These are information that Canadians have seen published. The Globe and Mail saw the documents from CSIS. Has, did the Prime Minister also see these documents? Um, I can't, unfortunately, speak to specifics of what the Prime Minister has or has not been briefed on in all of this. Um, but as I said before, uh, in taking a step back from the specifics of your question, the Prime Minister has been briefed regularly and gets information in a variety of different ways on what was happening around election interference uh, in the last two elections. Thank you. You already said that. Did you see these documents? Uh, the answer would be the same for me. The, document. the documents that were shared with the, our Five Eyes allies with the governments of France and the Germans that were, that were reported on in the Globe and Mail that Canadians were made aware of in newspaper articles. The F Prime Minister certainly saw these documents, did he not? Um, I ca as I said, I can't get into what the Prime Minister has or has not been briefed on in terms of uh, specifics of intelligence. Um, it's, uh, it's frustrating, I know, <laughs> uh, for me as well. Um, but it's for very important reasons that I laid out in my opening statement. I'm trying to help you, Ms. Telford. In the days that followed the 
report in the February 17th by the Globe and Mail, the Prime Minister himself said in response to questions on these documents, we are very concerned by the leaks, particularly because there is so much inaccuracy in the leaks. So the Prime Minister himself commented on the content of this report. What revelations by the report of February 17th were inaccurate, as the Prime Minister said? So I um, have already referenced uh, over the course of the committee today, uh, Madam Chair, at least one inaccuracy that the NSIA uh, has spoken to from, from reporting more broadly. Um, I can't, unfortunately, go further than where the NSIA went uh, or the director of CSIS went in, uh, when they were speaking before the committee. We'll review the facts reported by the Globe and Mail, Ms. Telford, because these reports are drawn from a series of uh, intelligence collection documents. The first fact, the objectives of Beijing were to uh, bring in a minority government. Was that uh, in, in, inaccurate? Was that what the Prime Minister was referring to as being inaccurate? Um. There have been a number of things we've been following up, obviously, on the reporting throughout uh, the last number of months, uh, and um, and there have been a number of things that that don't add up in the way that that we know them or that Merci. officials are able to tell us about. Merci. Thank you. I will raise another fact. The objectives of Beijing were to uh, bring to damage uh, conservative candidates that were seen as being harmful to its objectives. Did the prime minister see that as inaccurate as well? I would take a step back to where the where Canada was uh, in its relations with China going into the 2019 and 2021 elections. They were probably at their lowest point. Madame, Madame Telford. Ms. Telford, the question was, Just you this is something that I didn't want to do, but the time for in interpreters will not be taken out of your time. I will give it to you. If we could take a bit more time and continue as we are doing, I think that would be very good. So I, I understand very well that you have uh, questions, and I have both official languages. My first language is Punjabi. It takes a bit longer to say things in that language, so I know you don't speak it, but you speak French. So I will give you time. If you could not interrupt, uh, that would be better. Is that okay? Okay. So, Madame Telford, the P Beijing's tactics were given cash donations to those is, was that deemed in, inaccurate by the Prime Minister? Well, as it relates to uh, the stories around the 11 candidates, I think you've already heard me repeatedly, Madam Chair, talk about how both the NSIA and the Prime Minister have spoken to that and to where they, where they saw a gap and an inaccuracy in the reporting. Beijing was asking companies to hire international students and to have them hired on summer election campaigns. Was that deemed to be inaccurate by the Prime Minister? I can't get into going further than they did. Um, I can, in, in terms of the NSIA, the director of CSIS, uh, the many other experts that have come before you on these issues. Deux dernières questions. Two last questions, Madam Chair. Some political cam campaigns were seeing a difference between the uh, donation and the amount reimbursed. Is that uh, deemed inaccurate by the Prime Minister? I would just say on, um, on matters related to, to fundraising and donations, Madam Chair, and I think all members here are very familiar with this. I certainly am from my days as a, as a past campaign director. Uh, there are very robust election finance laws in this country, and actually they were made even more robust and transparent under this government. And uh, if there were concerns there, there are methods to investigate um, uh, any fundraising anomalies that are seen or alleged to have happened. Uh, merci. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Telford, the Prime Minister is very quick to w reveal when information is false. And there is another thing 
that I would like to talk about in the article. The diplomats from the Beijing consulates, including former uh, heads of consulates, uh, were made statements that were false. Was, did he deem this uh, inaccurate when there was so much inaccuracy in these articles that he commented on on the report, the CSIS report himself, and you refused to make any comments on them yourself? Madam Chair, I appreciate that we are now quick to respond to things when I thought we had been uh, told many times we have not been quick to respond to things in the past. Um, and part of the reason we haven't always been able to be as quick as, boy, we wish we all could be in responding to questions on this is because this information and the subject matter is just so very important uh, that it's so important, as I said in the opening statement, that when you're getting fragments of information, um, not only to you know figure out what those fragments are and where they situate, but to put them into a broader context. And being able to figure out what you can and can't say publicly is not something that I should be sitting here doing. And that's why I set out in the beginning, I've got to respect the boundaries uh, that were set by uh, the National Security uh, and Intelligence Advisor and the Director of CSIS when they were here before me. Merci, Madame. Thank you, Madame Telford. Ms. Romanato. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and through you, I'd like to thank Ms. Telford for being with us today. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of things that I, I heard today, and, and I want to reiterate, there's a big difference between a willingness to share information and a capability to share information, and Ms. Telford, you've explained multiple t times it's, it's not a lack of willingness, but in terms of national security issues, we cannot share this information. You also, in your opening statement, explained a little bit about the impact of that, and my colleague, Ms. Um, O'Connell, referred to that with respect to our relationship with our Five Eyes partners. Um, the issue of foreign interference in elections is not something new. This is something that New Zealand is looking at right now in terms of their elections. This is something that's happening around the world. We saw this in the, in the presidential election in 2015, questions about that. You did mention the importance of being able to share that information and receive that information from our Five Eyes partners. But you also said something that was really important to me. As you know, my son is an intelligence officer in the Canadian Armed Forces. So I know full well the importance of maintaining information that does not belong in the public sphere. And to do so, and I will put in quotes exactly what you said, it puts lives in danger. We created the NCCOP Committee of Parliamentarians, and I've looked at those who sit on this committee, and I have full confidence in the members of NCCOP that are from all of our parties, including a retired colonel with over 25 years of service who sits on this committee, and I have the full trust in his capability to look at something like this. Given the measures that the Prime Minister has taken through various tactics, whether it be through the naming of a special rapporteur, we have SIGHT, we have the panel, we have the National Security and Intelligence Advisor, we have ENSICOP, we have PROC looking at this. I believe also it's come up in the Ethics Committee. Do you believe that the question of foreign interference and how to detect, deter, and counter it will take multiple, multiple prong approach given the complexity of this issue and the um, evolving uh, threats of foreign interference. Um, so a couple quick things, just on your, on your first point of how this is, this is not a new problem. I believe it was in the CSIS documents um, that were tabled sometime ahead of my appearance uh, in the last number of days. Um, it talked about actually how CSIS briefed us in, in 2015 when we first got into government. This has been, this was, this was not new uh, to our government, but as I said in the opening statement, it has been evolving. And this government has taken more steps uh, than, uh, than anyone has before. And actually, one of the steps, you, you mentioned a number of them there, and, and one other one that involves our allies is the rapid response mechanism that Canada actually played a leadership role uh, because it was the G7 meeting that was in Charlevoix. 
um, where that came about. And actually some additional countries have joined uh, beyond the G7 um, to be part of that work. Uh, so Canada has actually been leading on this in, in the world, and to your point of the multi-prong nature of this, it's why in 2019, um, and I, I mentioned this uh, in my opening as well, there was a kind of pan-governmental whole of government um, plan to protect democracy that was introduced, uh, because it has to take into account misinformation and disinformation as well, and so the Department of Heritage is involved, and there's, you know, Many, many different departments and agencies throughout government have to be thinking about these things and are and have been for a number of years now, though there's obviously still more work to do. Thank you so much. And I brought this up in an, a previous um, a previous PROC meeting. Would you say that perhaps one of the recommendations that PROC can make coming out of this this study would be to make sure that members of parliament are adequately briefed on how to recognize and mitigate and prevent foreign interference. Um, would you recommend that this committee suggest that members of parliament and perhaps even their staff be briefed on what to look for, uh, not only in election period but in terms of our day-to-day -day, um, actions? Would you recommend uh, that members of parliament and their staff receive uh, some training in this regard? Ms. Telford, before you answer, and I will provide you time to answer, I just want members to know in the room that you are recognizing that the camera might not be switching from the person who is speaking at all times. I know, Ms. Romanov, you did not notice that the camera was not on you in the room. Uh, we understand that for public broadcasting on Pearlview that it is switching. So that issue for the purposes of this room, um, we will get sorted out, but for the public... Mrs. Romanato, not only did they hear you, they saw you, um, and that is something that's very important um, to us here. Mrs. Telford? Uh, just two quick thoughts on that. One is um, certainly there is, is training for, um, and, and I received it when I first came into government, uh, one of the more eye-opening briefings you can get. Um, and then... Um, but in terms of members of parliament and whether more should happen on that front, uh, I believe there were recommendations about that. I'm, I'm now not recalling whether it was which, which of the reports, but I think coming out of NSI COP, actually. Um, and that is also uh, has subsequently been followed up by Minister LeBlanc and uh, Clerk Charette in the report that they just produced showing all the different actions where they went through all the different reports that have been put out in the last not that many years, um, and identified sort of what all of the different uh, kind of next steps still are to be taken and by whom and by when, um, and I believe that is in there. Thank you. Continuing on with our third round, we will be starting with Mr. Barrett, suivi par Monsieur Fergus. Followed by Mr. Fergus and Madame Normandin, and then Ms. Blaney. Madame Thomas. A puis, Mr. Turnbull. And then Mr. Turnbull. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Telford, for uh, being here today. In the document uh, received from the Privy Council Office, the Prime Minister's Department, that was requested on March the 2nd, uh, it was received by this committee this morning. Um, it states that on September 28th, that cleared Liberal Party of Canada representatives were given a uh, security briefing. Who were the senior Liberal Party officials who were part of that briefing? Uh, I was not. Um, and uh, I believe you have invited to this committee the, uh, the national campaign directors of the 2019 and 2021 campaigns, um, so they can speak to that in more detail. Do you know who the cleared representatives were for the Liberal Party? I do know that Azam Ishmael, who you have invited to the committee, uh, was one of those cleared representatives. Okay. Was Zita Astravaz one of those uh, cleared individuals? I don't believe so. Okay. I can't say that with absolute certainty, but I don't believe so. To your knowledge, has, or has it been brought to your attention since that time that the then candidate for Don Valley North was made aware of any of the briefing, the contents of any of the briefings given to cleared officials with the Liberal Party. Sorry, I'm not sure I'm following. Was he? Well, oh. Did did the candidate for Don Valley North, to your knowledge, 
Uh, was he given a readout or made aware of the contents of the briefing that was given to the cleared officials with the Liberal Party? Uh, so, Madam Chair, not, not to my knowledge, but I was not involved in that at all um, during the campaigns. I was on a full-time leave for both campaigns on the road with the Prime Minister for the whole campaign, so these were things managed by headquarters. Okay. Um, the 25 ridings in the GTA, who would have been responsible for them, to the best of your knowledge, during the campaign on behalf of the party? In I'm, sh I'm not sure I'm understanding again, Madam Chair. Do you mean in terms of who was kind of the campaign coordinator for yeah. the GTA? Yeah, reg regional organizer. I'm not even sure. I'm not the best person to speak to that. Um, I, uh, I really, you know, if you, if you wanted to ask me about 2015, I could help you out. Um, but uh, you're going to need to talk to the 2019 or 2021 campaign directors. I'm not even sure how it was carved up within the GTA. Okay. So that, that's not something that you would have known in your capacity on that campaign? No, I'm, sh I'm sure I know the person, but I'm not sure which person it was or if it was even done in the way that you're describing. Okay, and your role on the campaign was? I was on the bus, as they say, um, or on the plane uh, throughout the, entire the entirety of the campaign in 2019 and 21. Would you have access to those names now if you asked? Um, as, as, yes, I'm sure, I'm sure I could follow up, yes. Could you, would you undertake to provide those names, uh, the, the name of the individuals responsible for the, the, the GTA during the 2019 election campaign? Could you provide those to the committee? So, Madam Chair, I can follow up on government side, though I would encourage the parliamentary committee, since, since you have the national campaign directors from those campaigns coming, that it's probably more appropriate to be coming from the party side. Yep, but just to be clear, you're going to... You're but going I'll to, undertake, I will take it back and Thank see you very what much. I can do. Um, so... The, there, there were media reports that there was an urgent briefing given to the cleared Liberal Party officials. Um, and it, it would be helpful to know, again, in that same context, we will uh, ask the Liberal Party officials when they come who their, what their list of cleared officials were. If you could make the same inquiry um, and provide that information yep. to us, uh, and you've, it just, you've indicated to the affirmative? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. That would be incredibly helpful. Um, because this speaks to, of course, the concern that information was made available um, to, uh, to these officials who would then, it would be reasonably expected that they provided it to the Prime Minister, which is what you said. If, if, if you receive the information, you share that information with, with the Prime Minister. Yes, and, you know, Madam Chair, I, um, I, have, I have every confidence that they would talk to the Prime Minister okay. about anything they found out. Did you recommend to the Prime Minister against removing the candidate from Don Valley North as a, uh, as a candidate for election? Um, Madam Chair, I, the, uh, the member that's being discussed stepped outside of caucus quite recently, so I'm not sure what is being referred to. In, did, the, the question is, is exactly as stated. It's if you recommended when the candidate for Don Valley North was a, a candidate for election, if you recommended against his uh, removal um, from, uh, from the slate of candidates running for the Liberal Party. What I can say is I was never involved in a conversation um, on the subject. Okay. Conversations did occur. No, I'm saying I, w I was not privy to a conversation. I I don't have an answer for you on this because there was no conversation that I was part of on this subject. Excellent. Thank, I'm, you. thank you, Mr. Barrett. Um, I will just like to confirm that as part of the witnesses who you have asked to appear, campaign managers have been invited uh, to a future meeting, and we do anticipate that meeting taking place in the month of April. Um, invitations have been sent out to the four names that we were provided, one has confirmed and we're just pending responses from the other three and we hope to have those soon and we'll share that information with all members as it becomes available. Mr. Fergus. Mr. Fergus, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And through you, I would like to thank Ms. Telford for joining us today. It's very 
she's been speaking from the heart, and I appreciate the time that she's taking to answer our questions on national security. Ms. Telford, you mentioned in your statement something that, in my opinion, wasn't fully appreciated in many of the hyper-partisan discussions on the topic. When we are dealing with foreign interference, a large part of what needs to be done, the measures to be taken, are protected by politicians. They, it would be completely inappropriate for politicians to be informed. For example, CSIS transmits information to the RCMP or the uh, Federal Election Commissioner so that they can launch inquiries. And it is not up to politicians to direct investigations. Once again, it would be completely inappropriate. In your experience, the, do these organizations have they already do they already have cabinet permission to act and use the powers and tools that are available to them? I I certainly believe so, um, and uh, this would be the kind of thing again that uh, NSIRA, for example, or NSI COP. Um, through their different purviews, could be making recommendations on if they did see any gaps. Uh, but they certainly, law enforcement and security agencies have a number of different authorities that they do not need, um, nor should they have prime minister or, uh, or cabinet authorities uh, in order to proceed on. So just to confirm, it's not up to the prime minister's office to direct the activities of the RCMP or, or, of, uh, or of CSIS? Absolutely not. Not at all. Thank you. Uh, the director of CSIS also told this committee that the CSIS Act provides a number of tools uh, for CSIS to investigate foreign interference activities, adding and if I can just find the quotation here, it is, we investigate these allegations and we use all the tools at our disposal to try to better understand, characterize these activities and reduce the threat where possible. Are you at all familiar with these tools? Yes. Are these, can you provide that these, to, are these tools, uh, as far as you know, satisfactory? Um, look, I think, I think there is, uh, we're learning quite literally every day, um, more and more information that is going to teach us and, and teach different parts of government how they can improve and what more tools they may or may not need to have. Um, you know, the, these, these last number of months, even just in terms of trying to figure out how to how to communicate to the public on some of this uh, has been an exercise uh, for everybody in, in some cases in new and different ways, um, less so perhaps for the political side. But um, I, think, I think the tools um, have been used more than they ever have before, is, what, is my understanding. And I think you heard that from David Vigneault when he was here as the CSIS director. And agencies are talking to each other regularly, and they brief up regularly to ministers, to prime minister, uh, to each other. And it's because this has been, as I said, while it's not a new threat, it is a evolving one. And obviously, as, as one of the other members here said, you know, there's been a lot of events in the last number of years. So whether it was, you know, misinformation and disinformation being spread during COVID, which was talked about in, in one of the, I think it was the NSI COP reports, whether it's talking about election foreign interference uh, attempts, whether it's looking at... Um, Businesses, as I mentioned in my opening statement, and the minister from uh, you know innovation uh, was looking. At, actually, he made changes uh, earlier on um, within the last number of years on that front. Like I think the, the government has to continue to keep evolving and adapting as we learn about these threats. I appreciate that. If I can sneak in one last question. Uh, the Foreign Affairs Deputy Minister, David uh, Morrison, told this committee that the, the Cabinet Directive on the Protocol states very clearly that w whenever national security agencies become aware of an interference, they must consider all options to effectively address the interference. So the panel 
is in place to ensure that there is communication with the public if there's an incident that threatens the integrity of our elections. But before that, the protocol ensures uh, in the first instance that there's consideration of what could be done to actually address the threat. I think that's quite important. So, Mr. Ferguson. Oh, the question was coming. If you can ask the question so I can give a little bit of time to answer, but the beep, beep, beep's gone on. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, do you think, uh, do you have anything to add or can you provide any color uh, on what the government was thinking when the protocol was first introduced back in 2019? Um, so I think, you know, it was, a, it was a new thing going into 2019 and there was a review done of it. Uh, the review was made public. It was also studied by NSICOP and NSICOP determined uh, that the site task force and, and protocol had fulfilled its mandate. Um, but there were some lessons learned that came out of came out of those reviews, and they were followed up on heading into the 2021 campaign. And now there are some further lessons learned that we've all seen in terms of the review coming out of the 2021 um, protocol and, and, and panel experience. Um, one of those areas actually is in communications and um, figuring out how we, you know, going to an earlier member's comments around instilling trust in Canadians and ensuring we're always building trust with Canadians and institutions. That's one of the areas that it talks about needing to be worked on. And I think, you know, a great area of, uh, of a great area for parliamentarians to really uh, give some advice on as well. Thanks, Ms. Telford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Madame Normande. Madame Normande, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Madame Telford, you mentioned earlier that there was no in, that no information is hidden from the Prime Minister. Is that correct? On a eu le we had testimony two weeks ago at the Ethics Committee that the in about for about 40 years, CSIS tried a number of times to sound the alarm about foreign interference to one to, to several governments. If CSIS is sounding the alarm about information that is important, do I understand that systematically a meeting would be uh, organized with the PMO so that the information is transmitted? Um. Yes, and it could even be if there's an alarm being sounded, the meeting could happen with the Prime Minister extremely quickly as well. Uh, sometimes these things happen same day. And it's, you know, one of, one of the frustrations actually with some of, some of the, the commentary on all of this has been this, um, this feeling that, that th there aren't channels to do that. And um, I know that if it had ever been brought to my attention, if it had ever been brought to the Prime Minister's attention that there was something that was being missed, um, we would have acted on it. I would have ensured he knew about it, and I know he would have acted on it. Um, that, that hasn't been the experience. Uh, anything that has come forward, as I said earlier, he has acted on. Merci. Eva. Thank you. From that moment when we were reassured that CSIS was sounding the alarm, that the information make to the makes it to the Prime Minister. Who deems whether the information is correct or incorrect? Is it CSIS? Is it Madame Thomas? Is it you in partnership with the PM? Is it the PM alone who judges the quality of the information? Who is it? PM, in my opening statement, um, when we'll go off into, into, you know, the, into a skiff, uh, it's usually a group of people. Um, usually always, as the NSIA wrote in her memo, She's almost always there. Um, and uh, sometimes there will be other senior officials, as she deems appropriate, dependent on what we're talking about. The Prime Minister, of course, I am usually there, as I said in the, in the outset, and then sometimes there will be some other senior staff there as well. And it's really important that we take the intelligence and we talk it through. Uh, and if we need other experts to come in and be able to answer other questions, then that will get scheduled immediately. Yes, Mamada. And then who makes the decision to do in-depth in research or not on certain topics? I mean, largely I would defer to the experts, though through our peppering them with questions, which we do a lot of, as I said earlier, that can sometimes lead to even more needing to happen. And if you would allow me, when you refer to the experts, who are you referring to? Consider uh, the heads of our security agencies and then the experts that they will sometimes bring with them. An expert from a particular who specializes in a particular region in the world, for example, or who specializes in a certain form of intelligence collection or that kind of thing. Those would be experts in my view. 
Okay, merci. Okay, thank you. So when we ask it, I am the one who say it aloud, and you you continued, and that doesn't work for me. So please know that we have very little time, and we must maximize it. So I gave you a bit of extra time, and I think that it's up to me to to say yes or no, and so I'm saying it. Do me, do me. Ms. Blaney, two and a half minutes. So much, Chair, and of course, as always, everything through the Chair. Uh, so I hear very clearly, Ms. Telford, that you trust the Right Honourable David Johnston in his role as Rapporteur, and that's fine. What I am saying is that I trust Canadians. I trust their need to have trust in our electoral institutions, to be able to have these serious allegations addressed in a way that honours a national security and the need of Canadians to understand what has happened? How is Canada protecting itself? Is there any corruption that we should be concerned about? And how can Canadians have faith in the election process in the future? In my opinion, that can only be done through a public inquiry. So I'm just, I'm, I guess what I am trying to understand is what is the resistance from both the Prime Minister, the PMO, what is the resistance to giving Canadians a process that they can quantify, that they can see, that takes it out of the political sphere? You and I do definitely agree on that issue. You know, I find it frustrating to hear from some of the Conservative members that if you don't say this, then it means big, big problem over here. But I also don't like the sense that I think Canadians are having that these big concerns are being minimized. Look at all the things we've created. Don't worry, there's no problem to see here. I don't believe that Canadians agree with that. So it feels like we're having this tug of war and what we're forgetting in that tug of war is the accountability that Canadians require to have faith in our institutions. So I, I ask again, what is the resistance why can we not move forward in this way so that Canadians have assurance that their institutions are working, responding to the changing reality that we're in, and that we can have faith in those systems? Um, Madam Chair, I would just like to start by saying it, it, it was suggested, perhaps, that um, the member trusts Canadians and, uh, and, and that's somehow different than my own point of view on things. And I just want to say it is exactly because I trust Canadians that I do what I do and that I believe in elections so much and that I believe in the protection of our elections. And it's also why the government has taken the many, many steps that I've already outlined and many more that I didn't have time to get to um, over the course of our time in government. And it's not so much resistance as it is actually making sure we are setting up the right things, that the right environment is being chosen to be able to dig into the matters that you're talking about so that those exact questions you're talking about can get proper answers. Thank you. Mrs. Thomas. Um, Ms. Telford, on February 13th, the Globe and Mail reported that in 2019, a CSIS briefing to the Prime Minister's office and the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, who of course is you, um, warned about the connection that the former Liberal MPP for Markham Unionville had to the Beijing consular. The nation's spy agency, CSIS, told the Prime Minister's office and you that the MPP should be, quote, on your radar and that, quote, someone should reach out to Mary Ng to be extra careful, end quote. Uh, as he was her campaign co-chair, of course, in 2017 and was lined up to do the same job in 2019, uh, did the Prime Minister's office advise the current Minister of Trade to distance herself from the former Liberal MPP from Markham Unionville? So a couple of things on that. I believe the Minister um, has already spoken to the fact that uh, the, the individual you're talking about was not a co-chair of, uh, of her campaigns. To, I can't get into, as I've said before, I can't get into the specifics of what you're describing um, as, uh, as to whether it did or did not happen, whether we were or weren't briefed on it. But what I can, just to take a quick step back and try to, to give you a little more than that, is it's, it's okay. memos, though, usually don't make those recommendations. I, 
So that might be helpful just, for you to Just know. for clarity, he, he was, in fact, her campaign co-chair in 2017, so you cannot deny that, um, and was lined up for 2019, but then promptly dropped within a matter of time of this report being released. So that's just an interesting fact for the public to consider. I, I would also remind you, Ms. Telford, that you do have the ability to talk about the extent and the timing of briefings. And, and the reason I say that is actually because intelligence and security expert uh, Wesley Wark, who served for two terms in the Prime Minister's advisory with regards to intelligence and security, has said so. So if he says that you can provide those details, I'll take his word over yours. So let's just start on that platform, shall we? No, so no, no, my, no. I'm going to pause your time. That's great. I'm Thank not sure what's it. happening here. And I feel like we've been doing a really good job. I was actually saying that because the line of questioning has been so fruitful that perhaps we should try to get in a little bit of extra time past 2 o'clock just to make sure that we do get the information <laughs> that we are requesting. As I said at the top of the meeting, as I have repeated, this is not a courtroom. It's a procedure and House Affairs Committee where members of Parliament sit and we do important work. Comments are made through the chair. And Mrs. Thomas, as someone who has chaired committees very well, you know very well the important work we do as chairs. So I will ask you that comments be made through the chair. The floor is back yours. Through the chair, did anybody from the Prime Minister's office or the Liberal Party headquarters relay any information uh, to the current Minister of Trade regarding CSIS warnings about the former Liberal MPP from the Markham Union Bill? So, Madam Chair, I would encourage the members, uh, if they have questions on uh, the Minister, uh, Minister Ng or her, and her local campaigns, to raise them with her. I do believe she's on the public record, though, already on these questions. Um, and, uh, and I'm not sure things were laid out uh, the way I understand them uh, by the member in terms of those experiences. And the thing I was starting to try to say earlier that I think might be useful for the member to know is that recommendations don't tend to come to, to us saying you should go and do the threat reduction measure um, if, if there's ever one that's recommended. And so that's just something to consider in terms of how you are presenting, or sorry, Madam Chair, how the member is presenting certain things as facts that are certainly not the way that I have experienced things. Madam Chair, I wonder if the uh, if if Ms. Telford considered the Minister of Small Business a close friend. Madam Chair, yes, I do. So I'm I'm wondering then uh, why the individual testifying would not inform Ms. Ng about the troubling information that CSIS provided. Uh, Madam Speaker, I would take you and the members back to what I said in the opening statement. Even what we share between other cleared individuals within government is something that is we have to be incredibly sensitive and careful about. And threat reduction measures, if they are deemed as something that are necessary, is something that um, security officials do, not political staff. In June 2017, at Ms. Telford's request, the National Security Advisor prepared a document entitled, quote, Memorandum to the Prime Minister. And a draft of this memo was viewed by Global News, and it states that Beijing agents were assisting Canadian candidates running for political offices. I'm wondering what prompted Ms. Telford to request this memo. So as I said in my opening statement, I ask a lot of questions in a lot of meetings, uh, and, uh, and sometimes my name also gets attached to things um, even uh, even when it's not coming directly with me, I have learned over time. Um, but what I would just say, Madam Speaker, uh, while I can't speak to the specifics of, of this memo for the reasons I've said previously, um, my understanding through the reporting is that this was an unsigned memo and it's particularly strange and not my experience to receive unsigned memos um, on, in PMO. So I'm wondering then through you, Chair, did the Prime Minister receive the memo? It was requested. Uh, Madam Chair, the, the, my previous answer stands for that question as well. The previous answer Thank was you. that the Prime Minister the, the, receives the, and the, reads uh, everything. Uh, 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 um, I don't even know what's happening. We're doing so good. 
So we set a timer. The timer beeps at the end of a round. I've shown leniency that we can get you an answer beyond that time, and then we continue. I can ask to see if that timer needs to be louder, but it's been working so far, so I feel like we're in a good spot. Mr. Turnbull, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to Ms. Telford for being here today. We've had lots of good testimony at, uh, at our committee, uh, including yours today, Ms. Telford. Uh, but um, one in particular that I would like to quote was the CSIS director, uh, David Vigneault, uh, who stated, and I quote, what I can say and what we have said publicly many times over the last number of years is that actors who are engaged in foreign interference against Canadians do so at all levels of government, at the federal, provincial, and municipal levels, and they are doing it across party lines, end quote. You made a similar comment, I believe, in your opening remarks, um, that foreign interference really affects all levels of government and all political parties. Unfortunately, I think in our proceedings and throughout many months now, we've seen a highly politicized environment, uh, which is unfortunate. And we've seen some members of this committee indeed try to use this issue to score cheap political points, really at the expense of our democracy, I feel. Uh, so, Ms. Telford, do you think that Canadians are really well served by those trying to make this into a partisan issue? No, I don't. Um, and I think there's a lot of... Um, and, and I've, I've seen this obviously at times, but uh, not as, as much as I think we would all like, um, is to bring this into a nonpartisan arena um, or even a multi-partisan arena, right? I mean, that's the interesting thing in terms of some of the mechanisms that are in place that this government created because there was nothing before this government, um, certainly nothing anywhere close to the things that this government has put into place is that one of the mechanisms in a PSYCOP is multi-partisan. So I, I, I almost think of it as non-partisan because the work that comes out of it and the way in which they operate, it, it feels that way uh, in contrast to sometimes what we see in other places. Um, but it is actually a multi-partisan place that is all parliamentarians with full access. They are cleared and get full access um, on the subjects uh, that they are studying. Um, meanwhile, there's a whole number of other organizations, as I've already gone through, um, and then, as I said, there's a number of other things. If you were to talk to the Minister of Heritage, if you were to talk to um, Minister LeBlanc, like, there's a number of other ministers. Uh, much of government has to consider the possibilities of foreign interference these days, and so that's why there's a whole-of-government approach on this as well. But as you said, it's beyond government. It's, it's far beyond government. And so there have been organizations set up, coordination bodies set up between provincial and federal bodies. Um, there have been new kind of communication channels set up um, between uh, you know, security services and financial sectors and businesses and all kinds of things that have been going on the last number of years that would be really worthwhile everybody who hasn't already learning even more about, because I think these are things that could give comfort to Canadians to know that all these steps have been being taken and that it is being taken this seriously, not just by this government, but by the whole country. Because holding our institutions strong and being comfortable that our democracy is working, there's nothing more important than that, I don't think, for Canadians. I concur uh, wholeheartedly with that uh, statement and that very strong sentiment that you've just sent. Um, one of the things that struck me in our proceedings over time and time again as, as slightly unjust is, is uh, the constant accusations that we've heard that our government or that this government hasn't taken action to combat foreign interference. But the facts really simply do not back that up. As you mentioned in your opening remarks, uh, David Morrison said before this committee that the tools to address foreign interference are increasing. NSI COP and CIRA and the panel did not exist before this government took office. We, we set up the critical election incident public protocol, which is the panel uh, or the panel as part of. We took lead on setting up the G7 country with the G7 countries, the rapid response mechanism, uh, the protocol, the panel, the, the RRM uh, were all part of our four pillar uh, plan to protect Canadian democracy. And we've continued, in my view, uh, based on all the evidence that's out there to adapt and evolve our response. 
the protocol was independently reviewed uh, after both of the last two elections and updates, updates were made to really strengthen it. These are just a few examples. You've cited some of them and I think we could all list many others. And there's always more to do. I think we've acknowledged that. You've acknowledged that in your remarks. But would you agree that this government has taken strong action on this, that we take it seriously? And in fact, uh, we've taken more action really than ever, any previous government. Yes, I believe that to be factually uh, correct, as well as um, this government has also committed to taking even more actions and very soon and are in the midst of doing that. Great, and we've heard uh, that foreign... Uh, no, sorry, uh, Mr. Turnbull, I know you couldn't hear it possibly, but you wrapped up right it, yeah. as the group happened. Sorry, Madam Chair. And Ms. Telford has provided you an answer, so thank you for that. And now we will enter into our fourth round. We're going to start with Mr. Cooper, followed by Mr. Zuberi, Madame Normandin, Mrs. Blaney, and then I'll give you, get you two more names, and that will bring us to an end. Mr. Cooper. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, Ms. Telford, for you, Madam Chair. Ten weeks before the 2021 election, Bob Soroya, the then Member of Parliament for Markham Unionville, received a cryptic and threatening text message from Beijing's Consul General in Toronto suggesting that he would no longer be a Member of Parliament after the 2021 election. Were you the Prime Minister or anyone in the PMO briefed or otherwise have knowledge about that text message? Um, Madam Speaker, I, Madam Chair, um, I, uh, I can't speak to, uh, to this information um, and uh, I, yeah, I can't, I can't speak to that information, you, you I'm sorry. You can't speak to the information because you don't know why? Can't you speak to this information? No, and because, as I said before, as frustrating as it is for both of all of us, um, is uh, I can't get into confirming, let alone denying uh, information and going beyond the bounds of the security heads who were here before me. Well, uh, I find that very, very interesting that you will not confirm whether you have knowledge of that text message. Um, do you have, I'll ask a, an even broader question. Do you have any knowledge of interference by Beijing in the 2021 election in the riding of Markham Unionville? I can't speak to specific um, pieces of information. As, as you know, I was not the cleared representative during the campaign, sorry, as through the, through, uh, the chair. Um, the member knows I, I was not the cleared representative during the campaign. But in terms of what I have been briefed on subsequent to the campaign, um, and you will have seen a lot of this come out of the review of the of the panel's work during the 2021 campaign. So broadly speaking, yes, I have been briefed on attempted interference and influence during the last elections. And that occurred in the riding of Markham Union Bill, yes or no? I can't speak to that, Madam Chair, in terms of the specifics. Uh, an upper convenient uh, non-answer. Uh, Ms. Ms. Telford, through you, Madam Chair, uh, when I asked you in my previous round about when the Prime Minister first learned about Beijing's interference in the 2019 election. You didn't answer it. You said it's part of an ongoing conversation. You conveniently refused to even acknowledge uh, your knowledge, your familiarity with one of the very few documents that has been produced by the Prime Minister's own department, the PCO, dated February 21st, 2020, but, spe but spoke about a, a subtle but effective interference network in the 2019 election. So in the interests of transparency, Canadians deserve to know, when did those conversations begin? So in the same efforts, Madam Chair of Transparency, conversations about potential election interference attempts at began long before the 2019 campaign. That's why steps were taken actually to protect the 2019 and then more steps were taken in order to protect the 2021 campaign. And I think it's really important that it be said in this committee, because it should be said as many times as possible, that experts, very senior trusted public servants have come out saying that those elections were fair. 
Uh, Madam Chair, uh, no one is disputing that the overall uh, outcome of the election in 2019 and 2021 were not affected by Beijing's interference, but if even one riding was impacted, that is a problem. Uh, you acknowledge that there was interference by Beijing in the 2019 and 2021 election. I, I hope you at least acknowledge that much, Ms. Telford. Madam, you, Chair, Madam Chair, I assume when the member talks about Beijing all the time, he's speaking about China foreign interference. And yes, I have acknowledged that right in the opening statement that there was very, foreign interference by a number of states, and that's written into the reports as well. Very, very good, uh, Madam Chair. Then, Ms. Telford, through you, Madam Chair, the advice of CSIS to the Prime Minister is that the policy of a government in response to foreign interference should be grounded in sunlight and transparency and that such interference be made known to the public. I was provided in a briefing to him on January 21st, 2021, another one of the few documents produced to this committee. Why is it that in the face of your acknowledgement of Beijing's election interference, and the advice that CSIS provided to make such foreign interference known, the Prime Minister instead kept Canadians in the dark. Madam Chair, I will be quick on that and just say, you know, it's rare for the member and I to agree on anything, but what we can agree on is the importance for transparency and sunlight and growing confidence uh, for Canadians in our institutions. And it's for that reason that our government took steps to protect the elections that had never been taken before. Thank you, Ms. Telford. Mr. Zuberi. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Ms. Telford, for joining us today. Or actually quotes from testimony that actually was given at this committee before. Um, by Mr. David Morrison, Deputy Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs. He spoke about the limitations and caveats around intelligence. Um, he said to this committee, uh, let me simply say that intelligence rarely paints a full or concrete picture, uh, or actionable uh, picture, I should say. Intelligence almost always comes with a heavy caveat and is qualified in a way designed to caution consumers such as myself, he's referring to himself, the Deputy Minister from jumping to conclusions, while at the same time helping us at least to gain a little more awareness. He continues, now I, for one, am very glad we live in a country where even information of unknown reliability is passed up the chain, because that allows people like myself, again the DM, daily consumers of intelligence, to begin to form a picture of what might be going on and the steps that might be needed to, take, uh, to be taken if information turned out to be accurate or part of a larger pattern. He continues, but let me say it is extremely rare to come across intel, an intel report uh, that is concrete enough to constitute a smoking gun. Intelligence is just, is much more uh, a game of disparate pieces of information, many of which don't seem to fit together, at least initially. He continues, in this context, I would like to make a final point. Intel that gets leaked is is taken out of context. For example, a report from a single corroborated source. If that report instantly becomes taken as fact, this can be prejudicial to Canada's national security. There is nothing our adversaries would like more than to divide Canadians and to call into question our very institutions that keep Canada safe. I know you spoke about this in your opening statement. Would you like to elaborate a bit further on uh, the DM's comments uh, in relation to this? and his previous testimony. I would just, you know, and it's something um, that might be worth, so thank you for that, because I, I think it's worth pausing on a little bit more something I said in my, in my opening, which is sometimes the intelligence is, is wrong. The, 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 in whatever form you're looking at it, there is something that you are, whether it's because you talk it through with others, you're looking at it in a different context, you're comparing it to other things, because of your own knowledge, because of somebody else's knowledge in the room, you know it to be wrong, and yet you still look at it because it paints a, a broader picture. You still leave it in there because it's useful to even know that there's that information that's being spread out there or that's being stated somewhere for some reason. And if that is taken completely out of context, then no one has the opportunity 
to put it into that wider context, to know what is true and what isn't true. Also, some of it you need to take time with to be able to figure out its veracity. And, um, and that is why we have people who specialize in analyzing this information, who get to know the, the, whether it's from a region or a, or a community, whether it's domestic or foreign, but, but where they're looking at it and able to um, become expert in it over time or come into the job being expert and give us that best advice that unfortunately Canadians aren't able to get in the way that some of this has been coming out of late, but that I'm really hoping that through the good work of NSI COP and NSIRA and potentially other things that um, the special rapporteur will give us advice about that Canadians will be able to get a better sense of the picture. Thank you. And another question I'd like to touch upon is last month the Minister of Public Safety launched a consultation on to, uh, about uh, having a foreign registry, foreign influence registry I should say. And this is a critical step uh, that we uh, should be taking, this consultation and, and uh, potential action on that. We know that diaspora communities are particular, are particular um, they face the challenges of foreign interference. Diaspora communities are impacted by this. The CSIS director, uh, David, um, uh, the CSIS director um, came before the committee and said that CSIS has been clear that the principal threat to Canada comes from the People's Republic of China. But to be clear, he continued, the threat does not come from the Chinese people, but rather from the Chinese Communist Party and the government of China. Indeed, we are keenly aware that Chinese communities are often the primary victims of the PRC's foreign interference efforts in Canada. This distinction that he's making between the government and the Chinese people is critical. Would you like to elaborate on that? No, I'm, I'm really glad you, um, you raised that. And it's something, you know, I mentioned it very, very briefly in my opening statement about the impact on, uh, on communities, because this isn't something that is only an election uh, focused issue. Uh, foreign interference is much broader than that um, and has been going on for some time in, in all different parts of our communities, but particularly diaspora communities. And uh, we need to pay extra care that when we are, or take extra care that when we are creating any of these mechanisms, that they are taking that into account on how to protect specifically our diaspora communities and whatever steps are being taken. Thank you. Mr. Telford, I'm sure you're um, maybe not noticing that we're approaching the 2 o'clock hour. And just because there is just a few more questions that need to be posed, we would like to complete this round. And then we will do just a quick one-off to each of the parties, and then we will end shortly by 2.30. Um, so if we can just, um, I'm sorry to impose upon you, but I do appreciate your leniency. I know it's awkward for you to say otherwise right now, but I'm going to proceed as chair and just thank you in advance uh, for your latitude. Madame Normande. Ms. Normande. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a question, comment. Ms. Telford. There's been a lot of references to the uh, NSI COP about for managing the issue of foreign uh, interference, but he said it was very uh, difficult to obtain cabinet documents to do his work properly, and we know that they must counsel Mr. Johnson in the decision to recommend or not a public independent investigation. There is a context where there is funding at Canadian universities by foreign interests. There is increasing information that the found Trudeau Foundation had regular ties to uh, the PMO. There is more information about foreign interference and at least one, uh, at least 11 writings. Doesn't it become at some point uh, too vast to be managed internally and it needs a public independent inquiry uh, like Mr. Butts recommended? Um. Sorry, there was a lot in there, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, so on the prov provision of information to, uh, you know, NSI COP Special Rapporteur, I know that the Prime Minister has committed to providing and giving access to as much as, as possible. He provided unprecedented amounts of information um, and, and um, access to information during the POET Committee. 
uh, or inquiry rather in the fall. And so if there are concerns on that front, I'm happy to take those back. Um, in terms of ties to PMO and things, there's a lot of kind of assertion and innuendo there, Madam Chair, that I'd be happy to answer questions on if there are questions on that, um, because there is, um, there's not a lot there. Um, and just in terms of the, the broad question of is it too vast, well, it's exactly for that reason, um, that there are a number of different organizations looking at things, that the Prime Minister um, did the additional step of putting in place an independent special rapporteur to exactly identify what might be getting missed in all of this and what more needed to be done to ensure we are getting as much of the best work done possible into all these different parts, but also that we're effectively answering Canadians' questions, most importantly, perhaps. And on the role of Mr. Johnson, there is increasing information that there were ties between the foundation and Mr. Trudeau, and that uh, Mr. Johnson was aware of the donation and that he may rule that there is no need for a public inquiry without uh, does it are you not limiting his ability to make good decisions about holding an inquiry or not so um, I, I, I'm glad you asked that because I think it's, it's really important um, to make clear, and I know it's been said in other public forums, but to make clear here, given the, given the subject matter here, the Prime Minister has had no contact, no, um, like no, he's had no, no relationship with this organization for over a decade. So uh, when, when we insinuate that there are some other ties there, there just, there aren't. The, the tie is in the name. Merci. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, um, Madam Chair, and everything, as always, is through the chair, so I, I appreciate that. And, and I just uh, want to say to Ms. Telford, we had a little bit of discussion earlier on about a previous inquiry, and I've done a little bit of research on it, and... Um, it, I just want to quote from a Toronto Star um, article that it says Harper last month asked academic and lawyer David Johnson to craft the terms of reference for the inquiry and that Harper says he'll take whatever advice Johnson gives. So just clarifying that a little bit um, and happy to share that with you if that helps you understand the point of view that I'm coming from. But I do want to go back to this issue of having a public inquiry, having a transparent process that Canadians can have faith in. And I'm just curious, you know, there was some questions earlier about what we're seeing across this country, which is an increase of anti-Asian hate. And that's very concerning because it puts people who are in this country, uh, many Chinese people in this country who have been fighting for an extremely long time to get acknowledgement from this government about interference from China into this country. So people who were willing to take that step to draw, draw attention to that issue. So if the rapporteur comes forward and recommends a public inquiry. I'm just wondering if the PMO, if the Prime Minister, if Ms. Telford would admit that it was wrong to allow these issues to fester in the public mind for such a long period of time that it's created a distress that is just not necessary and that the longer we ask Canadians to wait, we are actually harming other populations by not seeing that action. So I'm just wondering if that would be the case and there would be a willingness to say, you're right, we should have just done this in the first place. Um, I feel like we're going to have to take the discussion on what happened in the past offline because I totally know the article you're talking about and I can point you to another one. Um, but I think we're actually dancing on the head of a pin there. So in terms of your, the actual substance of uh, the rest of your question, um, I, I believe, and I suspect we will uh, we will agree to disagree on this, Madam Chair. I believe what what is a bigger problem in terms of things festering at the moment is the partisanship and hyperbole that has been brought to this so often uh, in the discussion in the last while. 
And uh, it's why we needed to get the hand out of the hands and in, into hands like the agencies and, and committee of parliamentarians that do seem to be able to work in a way that doesn't do that. And it's why the special rapporteur was necessary because somebody had to be able to put their mind to it um, that was out of this space to figure out what those other appropriate next steps might be. Thank you. We're going to go four minutes to Mr. Brock, followed by four minutes to Mrs. Sahoda. Mr. Brock. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Ms. Telford, uh, earlier today, my colleague, Mr. Berthold, asked you about the Global Mail story of February 17, 23, regarding Beijing's objectives in the 21 election. The Prime Minister is on record of saying that the report was full of inaccuracies without denying the existence of the report and not identifying what in the report was inaccurate. My colleague asked you that question. In your opinion, what was inaccurate about that report, you couldn't confirm. My belief is if the report was full of inaccuracies, you would identify those inaccuracies, or if the report was completely false, you would say so. So I'm giving you the opportunity now. Is the report truthful or not? So, Madam Chair, maybe I'll, I'll just give a crack at explaining why it is that whether or not it's inaccurate, I can't answer. Because if I started to answer the things that were either missing or inaccurate in, in some of the specific questions that you're getting into, it is as much as confirming then some of the other things that you might be raising. Thank you. I believe the most damning fact in that report is that Beijing's objectives in the 21 election were to help the Liberals secure a minority government and to defeat certain Conservative candidates. Do you accept that? Do you believe that to be the case? Madam Chair, my experience going into both of the last two elections was that our relations with China were at their lowest point, where I was working day and night alongside many, many, many other incredible Canadians to try to bring home the two Michaels who it was just amazing to see in Parliament uh, when President Biden was here Thank recently. you, Ms. Telford. CSIS tracked specifically the... Um, uh, sur surrounding circumstances involving the former Council General in Vancouver, her name being uh, Tong Ji uh, Ling, who held the post during the 21 election. In fact, CSIS reported that she was doing victory laps, um, bragging about how her role was to defeat certain Conservative candidates. You are aware of that. Is that inaccurate? Um, Madam Chair, I'm aware of the reporting on this matter, and I can't speak to what different countries' ambassadors and consul generals uh, have said. The Prime Minister was aware of this information? The Prime Minister is also aware of If you aware are aware of, of it, the Prime Minister is aware pausing, of it, correct? The reporting, pausing, Madam Chair. Pausing, pausing. You know, friends, colleagues, this just takes away from our time. That's all we lose. We all lose time. No one here is new. One person's going to speak at a time. It was not a courtroom at the beginning of this meeting. It still has not become one. It is the Procedure and House Affairs Committee, which I know has really high ratings. I'm sure there's many people watching, and they want to see the important work that we do here in the House of Commons. Mr. Brock. The victory lap that she was bragging about, is that false? Um, Madam Chair. Yes or no? Is it false? I it's a can simple only question. speak to okay, the fact that so I'm aware I'm gonna, of this through. I'm going to, Mr. Brock, it's very simple. We have someone coming to appear today to provide us information. What may be simple to you might not be simple to somebody else. I don't know. I've never been a chief of staff to the prime minister. I'm not sure if you have. Madam, so I'm going to ask Mr. Brock yes. that we permit Ms. Telford to answer. And when she gives a quick answer. And Ms. Telford, I have to commend you. Your answers have been quite short compared to most witnesses, and I appreciate that. So I'm going to give the floor to Ms. Telford, and it will be returned to you, Mr. Brock. Ma Madam if I Chair, have to just, come just for clarification, Madam Chair, the question was premised with a yes or a no. I didn't get a yes or a no, and that's why I referred to it as a simple question. So within the House of Commons, Mr. Brock, as you know, if there is unwritten rules, and oftentimes the amount of time that is consumed for the question or comment is provided to the person to answer, and I think it's only fair that the witness uh, be able to answer. 
So I recognized what the premise was. If you look at my premise, it's been, let's have a functional meeting and one person speak at a time. I've been doing this for many meetings. I've not yet achieved that, and I will keep trying. Madam Chair, so right now, Mr. Brock, you will have one minute left for starting with Mr. Ms. Telford. CSIS reported a month after the 21 election, it was well known within the Chinese-Canadian community of British Columbia that Ms. Tong wanted the Liberal Party to win the 21 election. Is that false? I, I think, Madam Chair, you'll know my answer on this, which is that I can't speak to uh, Thank you. specific. Thank you. CSIS reports reveal that Ms. Tong and former counsel Wang Jin made discreet and subtle efforts to encourage members of Chinese-Canadian organizations to rally votes for the Liberals and defeat Conservatives. Is that false? Madam Chair, I think what I would just remind the members is something I said in the opening and that's come up uh, throughout this committee actually, which is that interference in elections has an impact on all political parties. In November 21, CSIS reported that Ms. Tong described former MP Kenny Chu as a vocal distractor when discussing his defeat in the 21 election. She also is reported to have said that Mr. Chu's loss proved that their strategy and tactics were good and contributed to achieving their goals. Is that false? Is that inaccurate? Madam Chair, I, uh, I'm going to have to give a similar answer, um, but I would say that let's, it's, it's important to remind people because of the insinuations I think coming through from the member that the election has been examined uh, by experts and they have deemed it as uh, one that was free and fair. Mrs. Sohoda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, that was a very confusing line of questioning. I don't think there was a yes or no answer to be given uh, when you're asking for someone else's state of mind or someone else's belief from another witness that's present here today. Um, kind of like the hyperpartisan and political attacks we've been seeing from many members today about why the PM is keeping people in the dark. Um, why we don't want sunlight and transparency. I believe uh, through you, Madam Chair, to the witness, there um, have been many points where Ms. Telford has mentioned that a protocol unit has been set up. Protocol is in place. It is their job uh, to, if something rises to the level uh, past a certain threshold, and we've had, you know, Mr. Ian Shugart even say in a CBC News interview as well uh, that they were prepared to do so. They would have brought things to the public's attention had anything, even in one riding, risen to that level, uh, let alone anything had been national. So I'm wondering if I could get some more comments from you, um, from Ms. Telford regarding um, what her or the PM have within their responsibility to do based off uh, impartial parts of uh, information that you receive versus what um, agencies like the RCMP um, have in their ability to do if CSIS was to present information to them, um, pro what the protocol unit could do, um, who is responsible for shed, putting more sunlight or transparency into foreign interference that's happening uh, in our electoral process, which has been happening for, for some time. I think one of the challenges uh, that even comes out in your, in your question when you name a number of the different places is that there is no um, one person, you know, even if uh, as, as one of the members I know, at least one of the members I know, um, is, uh, would have liked an inquiry already. And, you know, one of the challenges is into which part exactly? Um, what does it look like exactly? Like, where, whereas, with, whereas with POEC, there was something built into the legislation where there was a clearly mandated, time-framed, um, clear question that had to be answered. In this case, this is something so diffuse and across so many different parts of government, um, let alone other levels of government. Uh, it involves law enforcement, which obviously works very independently and separately from from certainly from uh, the political side, but uh, but also from from all other parts of government. Oftentimes, even if even if they coordinate with other parts, um, the security agencies are obviously incredibly incredibly sensitive organizations. So, how all of that can come together and be better reported on, I think, is is an 
is an excellent question and one, you know, that I think NSI COP has, has made great strides at trying to find different ways, whether it's training to members of parliament or um, and, and better communications and ongoing communications with members of parliament, um, or whether it's a whole series of other things that are in Clerk Charette and, um, and, and Minister LeBlanc's uh, um, report that they just put out of a whole bunch of other next steps that can be taken. Um, but there's so many different things, and I think we're seeing that through all the reporting. There are so many different things that there is not just one one answer here to be given because this is an ongoing body of work that is com- totally multi multidisciplinary. Almost doesn't even uh, doesn't even quite cover it. Thank you, Ms. Telford. Um, and I know it's not convenient, uh, as some members point out, for you to even be here today and to be. Fine, walking this fine line, um, which you have to do, and it's quite the balance. It's c- very convenient for the leader of the of the Conservatives not to take briefings, so that he can say whatever he would like to say. So, uh, I just want to thank you in, in conclusion for being here today and shedding some more light uh, as much as you could uh, in this forum. Thank you. Thank you. We would do a quick last round. Um, not exactly as planned, but I understand it's going to be Mrs. Thomas sharing time with Mr. Bertold for four minutes, Ms. O'Connell four minutes, Madame Goudreau and Mrs. Blaney two and a half minutes each. Mrs. Thomas through the chair. Uh, through you, Chair. Um, I believe what we heard today then from Ms. Telford and the testimony that she provided uh, was the following. Uh, today she was asked a series of very simple questions. They were questions that did not require top security clearance. Uh, and yet, um, we were fail- it, there was a failure to give proper answers. Um, we asked questions with regards to the Prime Minister's knowledge. We asked questions about the briefings that he received. We asked questions with regard to whether or not he was informed concerning Beijing's interference in our elections. Ms. Telford refused to provide simple answers to these very simple questions. We know that numerous intelligence documents were made available to the media and have been reported to the public. We referenced those documents throughout our questions today, and again, the uh, questions that we put forward were skirted uh, or altogether uh, shot down. Now, what's quite convenient is that Ms. Telford cannot confirm the existence of documents that contain, of course, the most damning information concerning the Prime Minister, And with that, I'm talking about documents that reveal Beijing's interference in our elections, uh, Beijing's motivation to elect liberals to the House of Commons uh, by providing paid staff members to these campaigns, as well as funneling hidden, secret, and illegal money to them. Uh, Ms. Telford was not able to to discuss these documents conveniently. (coughs) What's interesting, however, is that Ms. Telford had no problem whatsoever denying the existence of some documents. But when it came to this document, the document that shows Beijing's interference in order to elect liberals, Ms. Telford did not deny the existence of that one. So I'll allow her silence to speak for itself. However, Ms. Telford also told us that the Prime Minister is briefed regularly. Ms. Telford also told us that she is the Prime Minister's right-hand individual, constantly with him, that, uh, and I'll quote directly, the Prime Minister reads everything, and quote, there is nothing that is ever kept from the Prime Minister, end quote. So given the fact that the Prime Minister reads everything and that nothing is ever kept from him, the committee must then assume that the Prime Minister was aware and that the Prime Minister chose to actively ignore and avoid the information, the briefings and the warnings that were given to him by our top security and intelligence agency in this country when it comes to Beijing's interference. And one must conclude that the only reason to turn a blind eye to such information is certainly not in the best interest of the Canadian electorate, and so therefore only in the best interest of the Liberal Party of Canada, which of course benefited from this interference both by getting money and paid staff in order to secure their writings. I'll leave it there. 
Madam Chair, it's there was no question, Madam Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Telford. Madam Chair, it's interesting that I was accused of silence, then told I wasn't asked a question when I was trying to answer, and further was then being quoted in the statement that was just made. So apparently I did say something. And Madam Chair, I would just say that what was being alleged, or at least a part of what was being alleged there, were infractions of Elections Canada law, and there are mechanisms for those things to be investigated. And so I would just suggest that you be speaking to the appropriate agencies about what, if anything, should be happening on those fronts if those things are the case. And I think the member probably could have written this, Madam Chair, beforehand, and that was one of the reasons that I was concerned about, uh, and I think many were concerned about whether or not it was the appropriate thing for me to be coming to this committee. Thank you, and I will just note that the comment that was made by the member took um, over three minutes, and you were able to respond in less than a minute, so the time to the member was way greater than for yourself to respond. Ms. O'Connell, four minutes to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Telford, thank you for being here again today. I think what we just witnessed was exactly what Canadians don't want out of this process, which is the Conservatives were not getting the uh, allegations, the, the clips that they wanted throughout the day. So they resorted to just making a statement after weeks of asking for you to appear decided to use their last minutes to try and not actually ask you any questions and just summarize a series of conspiracy theories, frankly, that have uh, testimony here today does not corroborate. So in the last moments that I have left here, I'd like to ask you about the process. Ms. Harder talked about uh, how you could have conveniently or you conveniently gave non-answers even though you could have. As I would presume Ms. Harder, but I won't make any assumptions, doesn't um, have the uh, process that goes into actually classifying documents or determining classifications on documents and information. So perhaps you could allude to or speak to that process of why you can or cannot speak to a matter of national security and who actually makes that determination because it's certainly not just the conservative members who feel that they didn't get the responses they were hoping for. Um, so one of the reasons I said in my opening statement I would... Um, respect the bounds that the CSIS director and then the NSIA um, put in place or had around themselves when they, uh, when they came to committee in a, in a public setting um, is because they are in a far better position to be able to uh, make those determinations uh, than I am and um, the, because the classification of material happens within within their purview, within their departments. Um, obviously, it's different if it's material coming out of CSE, for example. Um, and there are a number of different places within government, but the ultimate advisor on this kind of information to the PM and who does report directly to him is the National Security and Intelligence Advisor. And all of us who get cleared, um, as I mentioned briefly earlier, all of us who get cleared have to sign documentation uh, where we make a number of undertakings. Um, and But written right into those undertakings is not only the consequences of um, from a from a legal standpoint of... Uh, revealing some of this information, but also the potential consequences of it, as I mentioned in my opening statement as well. And, um, and they can be very severe for the country, and it's why we should all really respect them. Thank you. And as someone who used to sit on NSACOP, I went through that similar right. process and understand that. But part of that is also um, remembering what is classified and not classified, and you have to be extremely careful and why the national security uh, community determines an entire process in terms of when speaking in the public forum. And is this precisely why the critical election incident public protocol is in place to have the knowledge of the national security community who can um, take the full picture of intelligence and then provide it to a, the uh, incident public protocol 
uh, that are nonpartisan, and then they can properly make a determination on what constitutes the threshold to speak to Canadians during an election, knowing that um, they don't want to tip the scales in any fashion or even allude to that. But having a nonpartisan body with access to that uh, full picture of intelligence, why that's so important during the election process. Um, I think all of that is exactly right, and the only thing I would just add is that the senior officials who are part of that panel have spent their lives, uh, in most cases, serving Canadians as public servants. And so I think there's reason for all of us to have a lot of faith in the work that they do. Thank you. Madame Goudreau? Madame Goudreau. Thank you, Madam Chair. Two and a half minutes is not much time. Thanks again. To our witness, Ms. Uh, Telford, two questions. The first, given everything, all the information we've received today, efforts to avoid uh, interference in the measures that have been established for a few years now, since 2015, efforts have been made, we agree. But what can we say to Canadians? We're here today, we're clearly defending democracy is not working. What are you telling people at home? Because obviously there are alerts and unfortunately there is still interference. We can't deny it. Uh, Madam Chair, I would, I would disagree a little bit um, with just the the thought that it's not working. Because actually I think I think the fact that we're all having these conversations um, speaks to the fact that this is in the public domain in, a, in perhaps a new and different way. It doesn't mean that the institutions themselves have not been working. And I think there's questions to be asked. And I think those questions are being asked in a number of, of the bodies that we're talking about by the appropriate ones. There's ones that do oversight of the security agencies themselves. There's the, the NSI COP multis and multis multi-partisan parliamentarian group um, that's able to look at other parts. You know, there's a lot of different pieces to this, and I, I appreciate it's complex, but it's complex for a reason, and that's because this is a moment in the world, and that's where I think we have to take that step back from saying we have some specific challenge here that is unique to Canada and where Canada has to just, you know, snap its fingers and, and solve this, um, this problem overnight. I don't think this is something that gets solved overnight. I think this is something that's been being worked on for years, and I think it's something that our allies are dealing with too. It's why it was so predominant as a discussion point at the G7 hosted here in, um, in Quebec. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Chair. Given all of that, given that we're constantly adapting to our environment, how is it that between 2019 and 2021, how is it that Canadians were not made aware of the fact that it existed and that it will exist? Why was it hidden? And why has it been hidden for six months? So I would offer two things quickly. One is um, that there was the, the review of the panel's work that did speak to interference. NSI COP also continued between 2019 and 2021. I think, um, and what I'll just say quickly, because I can tell already I'm getting the look, but is um, I think there was a lot of other news between 2019 and 2021, and perhaps that's maybe why this wasn't, th some of those reports that were coming out on this subject were not in the same kind of, uh, spotlight as they might have been if there hadn't been a pandemic amongst many other things at the time. But a lot of this work was ongoing between 2019 and 2021 and being reported publicly. Thank you. Mrs. Blaney. Well, thank you. And through you, Chair, I agree that this work needs to be taken out of the partisan environment of Parliament. I mean, why did the PM not instruct Mr. Johnston to set the terms of a public inquiry than to decide whether or not to even have an inquiry. Is not is it not true that a public inquiry is the best way to take this out of partisanship? 
I think that's the the qu the first question. Um, I, I, may, I shouldn't put. I shouldn't. I don't know that it is his first question, but it probably is the first question he needs to answer. Certainly before uh, Madam Chair, the special rapporteur is able to answer what a mandate should look like. It's what what should the mechanism look like? What is what is the question we're trying to answer? What are we trying to satisfy here? What is the moment we're trying to meet with Canadians here that can give them the satisfaction that we all want them to be able to have in their democratic institutions? What's the best way to do that? First, we have to figure that out. Then you figure out a mandate. And if, and if those things can already be happening or already are happening through other means and the spotlight just hasn't been shone on them, maybe perhaps to my previous answer to a different question, then maybe that's something we need to think about. So I think there's, just, there's a lot more to think about here than a binary choice about you know, inquiry, no inquiry. And that's hopefully what is now happening. And actually, I'm certain it is. Well. If a public inquiry had started three months ago, I don't think we'd be sitting right here in this room today, but I'll leave that to you. So my last question the US, presidents do have the ability to declassify information as at will in a situation where the government has classified information to clear the air that would help if it was declassified without necessarily disclosing sources and methods that would concern national security, does Canada have a similar process? So I've heard the question. I understand the interpreters are not able to hear the question and that the internet connection might be unstable. So I'm not sure if something else is running on your computer. Did something change, Mrs. Blaney? Nothing changed. Okay. Um, can the interpreters confirm that you hear me now? You hear my voice. Mrs. Blaney, can you briefly summarize your question again? Okay, I'll try. I'm, I'm hardwired, so I don't know what could have happened. Presidents do have the ability to declass information at will. If there was a hypothetical situation where the government has classified information, that if it was a it would clear the air and it would be helpful if it was declassified without sources and methods. I'm just wondering if Canada has a similar process. Oh, okay. Um, I, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question and one I have been asking many questions about myself for the last while and it's not as straightforward an answer. Um, as uh, unfortunately what you just described from south of the border. Um, having said that, I would encourage you uh, to speak to officials on that further. I don't feel uh, expert enough yet, but I can tell you I've been asking a lot of questions on this uh, in the last little while. Thank you. So there is some connectivity issues taking place, I would say actually in this room, because there is a delay on the screen even. So I hear the comments being made in regards to the interpretation at the end having an issue. I um, empathize with that and we'll get to the bottom of it. Um, but seeing that we have come to past 2.30, I am adjourning the meeting. I am thanking Ms. Telford for coming to appear today. And just for the purpose of members, good news. Tuesday we will be doing BC redistribution during our normal slot. On Tuesday evening, we do have the 6.30 to 8.30 slot, and it will be Mr. Michael Wernick and Mr. Daniel Jean appearing um, for one hour each. We've not confirmed the hour. That's why the, the um, notice has not come out, but it will be there. With that, I wish everyone a great day. Ms. Telford, thank you for your time and attention. Everyone keep well and safe. Thank you. <laughs>